out there in Radio Land, we invite you to reminisce for a while this afternoon as we present Those Were the Days, brought to you with fond memories by Northwest Federal Savings and Loan Association, by Nelson Hirschberg Ford, and by Eden's Plaza Shopping Center. This is Chuck Shaden with another in our series of programs designed to bridge the sound gap between yesterday and today. Today is Saturday, September 1st, 1979. It's the Labor Day weekend, and so today on Those Were the Days, we present a holiday weekend special with an afternoon of great radio sound from the golden age of yesterday. Between now and 5 o'clock, we're going to tune in to Amos and Andy, Charlie McCarthy, Baby Snooks and Daddy, and Stars in the Afternoon, a gala look at the new 1946-47 season with an all-star cast. This is a real special afternoon, so stick around. And don't touch that dial. It all begins right after this word for Northwest Federal Savings. It's Northwest Federal Savings time. We've got more time for you. At Northwest Federal, we've got more time to help you plan a sensible way to save. The Northwest Federal regular passbook savings account is a safe, convenient way to watch your money grow. At 5.5%, your money earns interest from the day of deposit to the day of withdrawal with interest compounded on a daily basis. Because there are no time limits and no penalties for withdrawals, a Northwest Federal regular savings account is the easy way to save, whether you're saving for a vacation cruise or everyday needs. And don't forget, Northwest Federal pays the highest passbook rate allowed by law, one quarter percent higher than any insured bank. And your savings are insured up to $40,000 by an agency of the federal government. Stop by any Northwest Federal Savings Center for complete details and see how Northwest Federal does more for you. It's Northwest Federal Savings Time. We've got more time for you. And there's a good time in store for you tonight at Northwest Federal Savings when we resume our memory movies. The fall season, the brand new uh, fall 1979-1980 season begins tonight with a Laurel and Hardy double feature. Oh, we've got two funny Laurel and Hardy comedies. From 1938, we have Blockheads with uh, Patricia Ellis, James Finlayson, and Billy Gilbert. And from 1939, it's Flying Deuces with Gene Parker, Reginald Gardner, Charles Middleton, and Jimmy Finlayson. Two great uh, Laurel and Hardy comedies. You'll see Stan and Ollie at their best in this uh, double feature. Doors open at 7.30. Our film begins at 8 o'clock. I'm sure you'll enjoy this. Bring the whole family. Uh, donation is a dollar and twenty-five cents per person. Tickets are available at the door, or you can get them in advance this afternoon if you like at any office of Northwest Federal Savings. If you're near one, or just come on over this evening, and uh, we'll have a good time with uh, Laurel and Hardy. Next week, it's uh, Jack Benny, George Burns, and Gracie Allen, and Martha Ray in College Holiday from 1936. And then on the 15th of September, it's Rose Marie with Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy in the Indian Love Call operetta. And on the 22nd of September, Three Smart Girls Grow Up, starring Deanna Durbin. So a lot of good things coming up. If you'd like to get your tickets in advance to any of those programs, you can do so at any office of Northwest Federal. But tonight, and we'll be there tonight to, to welcome you and uh, say let's get rolling for a Another good season of uh, Saturday Night Movies and other special events at Northwest with Blockheads and Flying Deuces, two good Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy comedies. Now we've got a good comedy for you. We've got a good special program to lead off our Those Were the Days program today. This is um, the life story of Amos and Andy. It's an anniversary broadcast sponsored by Rexall, originally on CBS on February 14th, 1954. That was a, a St. Valentine's Day. This is a program featuring um, Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell. You'll hear Edward R. Murrow, Bill Hay, Bing Crosby, Jack Benny, Lowell Thomas, and uh, a number of others. Uh, there's somewhat the, the sound is somewhat less than we would like it to be, but it isn't objectionable. And mostly, we've heard, uh, we felt that if you get as you get used to the quality of a program, of a sound quality of a program, you you never you don't pay any attention because you're, you're listening to the content and you accept the way it goes. And this isn't too bad, but I just want to caution you a little bit so you don't think it's uh, anything in the mega cycles between your set and our uh, uh, sending uh, our super heterodyne up here at uh, FM 97. Now let's tune into the first portion of Amos and Andy. The 
life story of Amos and Andy, written by Joe Connolly and Bob Mosier, with Ed Murrow, Bill Hay, Bing Crosby, Jack Benny, Lowell Thomas, Jeff Alexander's music, yours truly, Harlow Wilcox, and starring in their own life story, Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell. Amos and Andy! The 10,000 independent Rexall druggists salute Amos and Andy as they start their second quarter of a century on the air. Tonight, by bringing you their life story. Tomorrow, with the start of a special Amos and Andy sale. Yes, tomorrow dozens, literally dozens, of Rexall products will be sold at exactly half price. Later in the program, we will list many of these half price items. So friends, make up your minds right now to stock up. Because every time you buy, you save at the Amos and Andy sale. It starts tomorrow and goes on for two weeks at Rexall Drug Stores everywhere. And here to introduce the life story of Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll, Amos and Andy, is one of America's most distinguished commentators. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ed Murrow. Tonight, we of the Columbia Broadcasting System pay tribute to Amos and Andy. For 25 years, Amos and Andy have been a familiar part of the American scene. But who are Amos and Andy? Where did they come from? Tonight, for the first time, the creators of these beloved characters step out from behind the masks of their famous portrayals to dramatize their own story. The story of Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll. I know of no one better qualified to help tell you this story than the voice so long associated with the history of Amos and Handy. Good evening. This is Bill Hay. Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll first meet one rainy night in Durham, North Carolina, right after World War I. Young Peoria-born Charlie Correll had been sent down from Chicago to stage a local amateur show. The cast was rehearsing on the second floor of the Elks Lodge, and Charlie, at the piano, was having his trouble with the chorus. All right, kids, here we go again. One, two, three. One, two, three. Hold it, hold it, hold it. You there, Dottie, on the end. You're cuter than a barrel of monkeys, but would you do your Uncle Charlie a favor and try to remember your left foot from your right? <laughs> that's right, that's the one. Uh, excuse me. You want to see me? Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but you are Correll, aren't you? That's right, Charlie Correll. Can I do something for you? I'm Freeman Gosden. I just started with a company producing shows, and they sent me down to pick up some scripts and music. Oh, yeah, so you're Gosden. Uh, be right with you, kids. How are you, Freeman? Well, I got all the stuff back at the hotel. Say, uh, you're putting this same show on over in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. We start rehearsals Monday. Well, then, listen, uh, how about getting up in front of these kids and showing them this step? I've got my hands full with the piano. Be glad to, Charlie. Uh, listen, folks, this is my new partner, Freeman Gosden. Oh, my goodness. Now, he knows this number, and he's going through it with you. So watch him, girls. All right, girls, here we go. <laughs> partnership was formed. For the next few years, they traveled all over the South, producing amateur shows, learning, working together. Those were lean years, the hard years. The boys did everything, produced, directed, wrote, and even performed in some of the shows. Then, one night in New Orleans, they were talked into appearing on a strange new device, radio. Say, this is something, isn't it, guys? The fellow says we sing into this big megaphone here. You think anybody will actually hear us? Well, one of the fellows here was telling me this morning they got a phone call from a woman who lives a mile away from the station. No fooling. <laughs> oh, that fellow with the earphones is waving at us again. Stand by. You're on the air. Okay, Charlie, hit it. 
gorgeous, gorgeous, everyone knows. They say you're gorgeous, gorgeous from your head to your toes. Mm-hmm. As a kid of men, you were a wow, wow, wow. You were pretty then, but look at you, child. What? Look, you're simply gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Yes, that was their first appearance on radio. But outside of a call from the woman who lived a mile away from the station, nothing came of it. Two years later, found them working in Chicago, still waiting for that elusive big break. Hello? Uh, Charlie, this is God. Well, where are you? I've been waiting for you. I got us a date. Two girls from Evanston. One of their fathers owns a restaurant. <laughs> Bob O'Neill's office. Now, he runs radio station WEBH up at the Edgewater Beach Hotel. Now, he wants us to go on the radio as a singing team, and I told him we'd do it. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, kid. How much are we going to have to pay him? Not a cent, Charlie. And get this. At midnight, after the station closes down, the hotel gives us a blue plate supper free. <laughs> Yes, the boys went on the air nightly for W.E.B.H. They sang songs. When the red, red rabbit comes bob, bob, bobbing along, along, they told jokes. Say, guys, I'm going home tonight and give my father a bath. Give your father a bath? Of course. I've been sponging off the old man for years. Wrote, <laughs> announced, directed. Finally, six months and 135 blue plate suppers later, they got that big break. Ben McKenna, the head of the powerful Tribune station, WGN, sent for them. Well, let me get this straight, Mr. McKenna. You want us to go on the air every night and dramatize a, a, a comic strip? That's right, boys. One of the comics from the Tribune, the Gumps, Chester and the family. Now, isn't that an idea? Well, uh, well, yes, Mr. McKenna, but we're a singing team. I don't think we could handle it. Well, I think it'll be a great series for you. Well, I tell you, if, if that's the kind of a thing you're after, I got sort of an idea. Well, what is it? Well, you see, I was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia, and Charlie's traveled all over the South. What would you think of us doing a couple of colored characters? Yeah, now, there's something we can handle. Well, I don't know about that. I, I never thought of... Uh, Mr. McKenna, there's never been anything like it on the air. I tell you what... Why don't you boys see if you can come up with a script and some characters? Spend a week or so on it. Then we can take it from there. A week? Why, Mr. McKenna, we'll have a script for you the first thing in the morning, won't we, Charlie? You can bet your bottom dollar on it. What time is it, kid? Well, it's... Daybreak, whatever time that is. And we had to tell him we'd have a script in the morning. Charlie, I've been thinking over these comic strips. Now, now take Mutt and Jeff. Now, that's popular. Yeah. One fellow is a great big man, and the other one's a little bit of fella. And that's what we've got to get. Yeah, but the people aren't going to see us on the radio. Well, we've got to do it with our voices. Maybe if one of us had a high voice and the other one a low voice, that would give them a picture. Yeah. Say, guys, you're right as two rabbits. Yeah, you know, Charlie, I think we're getting somewhere. You you can get your voice down pretty low, can't you? Well, yes, I can get down pretty low. Uh, Keep going. Get down lower. Uh, Like down here? Not bad. Now, listen, uh, see if you can put a a little dialect in it. Yeah, well, I'm going to stay right down here and talk like this this here. Uh, how does it sound, Brother Gosling? Sounds great. Now, you hold that voice, and I'll try to get a high one. Yeah, I'll do that. And you get on up there. Uh, how does it sound up here? No, go get up higher. Get, uh, get way up there. Uh, how does it sound up here? Yeah, put a little dialect in the thing. And put a rasp in there, like that uh, little fellow that worked in the drugstore in Atlanta. Uh, yeah, put a little rasp in there. Uh, how do that sound to you now, Brother Carell? That uh, sure sounds good to me, boy. I think we done got something here. Boy, I sure hope so. Good 
evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is your Rexall family druggist with a few of the half-price specials at the Amos and Andy sale that begins tomorrow. These next two weeks are the first in the history of our Rexall drugstores when dozens, literally dozens, of guaranteed Rexall products will be sold at exactly half price. Best of all, this two-week sale is store-wide. You'll find almost a hundred super specials, plus this unprecedented free offer. You get an unbreakable plastic tumbler in your choice of beautiful colors. Absolutely free when you buy any of a dozen special items. So, friends, be prepared for overwhelming savings at the Amos and Andy sale tomorrow through February 28th at Rexall Drug Stores everywhere. That's the first uh, segment of the Amos and Andy Life Story broadcast uh, on February 14th of 1954. This is Chuck Shaden with you today and every Saturday from 1 to 5 on WNIB in Chicago at FM 97. Well, I've got, um, I've got bad news and good news about Fred McDonald's book, uh, Don't Touch That Dial. The bad news was that we sold out of it last weekend at the MGM shop. The good news is that we have many more copies in stock now, and uh, better than that, uh, Fred McDonald stopped at our Metro Golden Memory Shop during the week, and he uh, autographed all of those uh, copies that we have in stock. So it's about the only place in town. The book actually isn't, uh, hasn't been officially published yet. It's published and it's out, but the publication date isn't coming out for a while. And uh, so we, and I think the bookstore at the Northeastern State University, are the only places in town you can get a copy of this book. It's a fine book. Don't touch that dial. It's radio programming in American life from 1920 to 1960. It's written by our friend Fred McDonald, and Fred was with us for many, many weeks here on WNIB as we were going through that broadcast year, that, I mean, the, the complete broadcast day from the year 1938. You can pick up this book. It's in soft cover. It's available for only $8.95 in soft cover or $15.95 in hard cover. And you can get your autographed copy uh, at our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. In fact, when you pop into the shop, you'll be amazed uh, at the supply of things that we have to uh, bring back the old times and a lot of old things, too, there to provide some more good times. We have more books on radio and the good old days of radio than you will find in any single spot, any place in the city of Chicago, and I think I can say that irrevocably and truthfully. Pop into the MGM shop and get a hold of Fred McDonald's new book, Don't Touch That Dial, published by Nelson Hall. It's a goodie. 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. We're open seven days a week, Monday through Friday from 11 till 5. Saturday from 11 till 7.30. We're there right now, and you can stop in uh, on your way over to the Memory Movie tonight at Northwest Federal, because we'll be open till 7.30. And on Sunday from noon to 5. Now, we will be closed Monday, Labor Day, but pop in today or tomorrow or next week one day and get your copy of Don't Touch That Dial, Fred McDonald's book about radio programming in American life from 1920 to 1960. You can use your Master Charge or your Visa card at Metro Golden Memories, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Now let's return to Amos and Andy. Well, one month later, Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll went on the air as Sam and Henry. And two years later, it was the top program in the Chicago area. Success seemed to be there. Then one day, they went to Ben McKenna with a proposition. Well, that's the idea, Mr. McKenna. We heard that one of the big broadcasting companies is starting a coast-to-coast -coast network. Yes, and we'd sure like to get on that network, Mr. McKenna. Boys, I understand your enthusiasm, but we here at the station want to keep Sam and Henry as our exclusive feature. But, Mr. McKenna, we think this is the opportunity of a lifetime for us. I know that, boys. I know it. But after all, we own the name Sam and Henry, and we don't want to make any rash moves and take the chance of ruining the show. All right, Mr. McKenna. Thank you just the same. Come on, Charlie. Well, he turned us down cold, Gus. What are we going to do now? 
What do we do, Charlie? We quit. Yeah, well, I... Quit? <laughs> quit, Sam and Henry? Now, look, Charlie, we can get you so far and no farther staying here on one station. Yes, but, gosh, we couldn't even take Sam and Henry with us. The newspaper owns the name. We'd have to start over from scratch. All right, we'll start over from scratch. Guys, I don't know about this. Suppose we're a flop. Now, look, Charlie, I don't know what it is. Call it intuition or whatever you want to. But I just have a feeling we're doing the right thing. Well, if you feel that strong about it, guys, okay, let's take a crack at it. After all, we've come a long way from the days of the Blue Plate Supper. <laughs> Thirty days later, their contract expired and the boys signed with the network. Opening night was only a few weeks away and the network was pressing for details on the new show. Well, thanks for calling, Mr. Johnson. Uh, yes, but we'd rather not release the name of the new program yet. All right, say goodbye, Mr. Johnson. Sorry, they're getting anxious about the name in New York. So am I. I wish we had one. <laughs> The show means everything. Yes, Charlie, and we've been working on it for a week, and, well, nothing seems to sound as good as Sam and Henry. Yeah. Well, come on, guys. Let's go out and get some supper. We need a snappy name like Jack and Mac or Tim and Tommy. Yeah. Push the elevator button, guys. Charlie, we must have made a list of over 500 names. Yeah, I know it. Oh, say, uh, how about Slappy and Happy? <laughs> no, I don't think so, Charlie. Well, here's the elevator. I wonder if Willie's on duty. He's a character, isn't he? Yeah. Well, well, Chuckle and Charlie and Stephen Freeman. How are you, boys? Oh, fine, Willie. Step right in. How are my two friends at the airway? Fine. Say, I hear you got a new program. Yeah, that's right. It starts next week, Willie. We're going coast to coast. Well, how do you like that? Ain't you the pair for the air? <laughs> hey, Lord. Well, well, look who's here. My football playing friend. Step right in, famous Amos. How's everything going in the elevator, Willie? Having my ups and downs. <laughs> Second floor. Going down. I'll move back, let the janitor get in with the stepladder. Well, make way for my old friend, Handy Andy. First floor, there ain't no more. Going up. Going up. Hey, Charlie, what we need in these names is something that'll catch on, something that'll be easy to, to uh... Charlie, what's the matter? Did you hear what Willie called those two fellas? Yeah, uh... Famous Amos and, uh... Handy Andy. But, Charlie, what I mean is, uh... Amos and Andy. Yeah, Amos and Andy. Well, they are both four-letter names... They're both sort of euphonious, and Amos is a biblical character. Yeah, and not only that. If we ever play a benefit, they list the names alphabetically. We always be right smack at the top. Yes, Amos and Andy started on the network from coast to coast. Fifteen minutes nightly at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time emanating from Chicago. About the third day, they started getting out-of-town newspaper clippings reviewing their show. Hey, Charlie, here's a review from a New York paper right on top. Oh, boy, what's it say, kid? Well, it's, it's, uh, 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 you'd better read the headline yourself, Charlie. Yeah. Amos and Andy, radio's biggest flop, has arrived. The much-heralded Amos and Andy made its debut on the airwaves last night at 7 o'clock with a thud, I might add. Don't read it, kid. It'll make you sick. Yeah, here's another one. This one's from Washington, D.C. You read it. What does it say? Amos and Andy disappointing. After a build-up of two weeks by network, Amos and Andy followed a sad organ theme with something about a fresh air taxi cab. This type of program has no place in radio. Holy mackerel. Look at here, another one. And they're all bad. Yeah. Boy, Simon Henry looks awful good right now, doesn't it? Charlie, there's no two ways about it. We're a flop. But what makes me feel so bad about it is that I talked you into it. Well, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't feel that way. We both went into the thing, and with our eyes open. 
Well, it's just that I got so enthusiastic at the time, Charlie. I wonder if you'd excuse me. I, I think I'll go out and walk around by myself. Well, I guess he wants to be alone. But even if the kid doesn't know it, I'm out there walking right with him. Will you look at all the items I've marked in the Rexall magazine ad? The items that go on sale for just half price at the Amos and Andy sale tomorrow. Yes, indeed, ma'am. This advertisement in Life, Look, Collier's, Saturday Evening Post, and Farm Journal gives all the half price items in the sale. I've marked a dozen things my family needs right now, like Rexall cold tablets and cough syrup and vitamin B12. You'll find several other Rexall vitamin products at half price, too. Rexall Theravins, Alpha Caps, Poly Drops, and Poly Caps. And I'm going to get both of the Caranome Beauty Specials, the lipstick and one of the creams, at half price. You'll find stag toiletries for men at half price, too. And don't forget the free tumblers and all the other magnificent specials throughout the Rexall drugstore. No, I won't. In fact, I'm going to make several shopping trips to the Amos and Andy sale. Well, ma'am, it continues for two full weeks. Tomorrow through February 28th at Rexall Drug Stores everywhere. I'm going to run, run right over there and get some of that uh, Rexall merchandise at half price now. Huh? Would that we could. February 14th of 1954 is the date of this uh, Amos and Andy life story is being broadcast here telling us how they got their new name and all that other business there. Good good program. A lot of fun listening to this. I'm Chuck Shaden. We'll get back to Amos and Andy on WNIB in Chicago at FM 97 in just a moment or so. Frigidaire Appliances, TV by Sony, Magnavox, and Quasar. Stereos by Sony and Magnavox. Corning Electric Ranges. Crown and Hardwick Gas Ranges. Shop no further. Townhouse TV and Appliances has them all. Visit Townhouse, and you'll be surprised at the selection and at the price. And that's not all. You'll get the Townhouse guarantee, guaranteed delivery on the day promised, guaranteed normal installation on all products delivered, removal of your old appliance to the basement, to the garage, or off the premises, and Townhouse also guarantees to remove all cartons and packing material as well. Townhouse means service, and you'll get it at 7243 Tui Avenue, just west of Harlem. Townhouse TV and appliances open Monday, Thursday, and Friday nights till 9, Saturday until 5. Now, are those where the day's program continues with the last segment now of the Amos and Andy life story? Amos and Andy continued on the network for the second week. There was no fan mail and most of the critics had reviewed the show unfavorably. This, I believe, was the lowest point in the lives of Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll. Then one morning, to get their minds off the program, the boys decided to play golf at the Tamashanter Golf Club in Chicago. Well, get on your shoes, Charlie, and let's get out and play nine holes anyway. Yeah, and I hope we don't run into anybody. You know how they are when they think your show isn't going so well. Yeah, well, let's get going. Yeah, uh-oh. Look who's coming in the locker room. That young fellow that sings with Paul Whiteman, Bing Crosby. And he sees us. Uh, hi, Bing. Yeah, uh, hello, Bing. Hi, fellas. Got that rubber around a bit, huh? Uh, yeah, we're going to play nine holes, I guess. Hey, uh, by the way, I caught your last three shows. Oh, you did, huh? Well, you know, I think that little opera you got there is going to catch on. What do you mean? I don't know. There's something there that, that makes you want to listen tomorrow night. I really think you got something, boys. And I like that, that Andy when he says, uh, I was regusted. Uh, well, thank you, Bing. That makes us feel pretty good. Then, a few days later, on Michigan Boulevard, the boys ran into a man they'd met a few years before in New York. Well, Freeman and Charlie. How are you, boys? Well, Jack Benny.
Nice to see you, Jack. I hear you open tomorrow night over at the Palace Theater. Yes, I got in from New York yesterday. Say, they're all talking about that radio show of yours back there. Uh, talking about it? Yeah. You know, to tell you the truth, at first, I don't know, I, I didn't like it. But after a few times, it, it, it kind of grows on you. You know what I mean? Even the kids backstage are listening to it. Well, thanks a lot, Jack. Yeah, well, we sure hope it catches on. Yes, boys, I really think you've got something there. Well, a lot of other people began to feel the way Jack and Bing did. The fan mail began to trickle in. The boys' spirits lifted. They worked harder. They experimented with their voices and created new characters. First, they added a great favorite with the listeners. Lightning. Ah, uh, yes, and Miss Amos, I'll whiz right on over there. The social man about town, Henry Van Porter. Well, now, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'm having a fitting with my tailor. He's put a new patch on the sheet of my pants. <laughs> the fussy, hen-pecked Brother Crawford. I want to tell you boys that my wife is very unhappy, and she won't stand for it. <laughs> yes. And as time went on, all of those other warm human characters, Ruby Taylor, Miss Blue, Sapphire, the old battle axe, <laughs> Pat Pending, Fluky Harris, Fred Wendell, and Madam Queen. And, of course, the greatest character of all, that lovable old rascal, the Kingfish. Now, wait a minute, Joe. Don't forget we are all brothers in that great fraternity the Misfit Knights of the Sea. <laughs> As far as millions of Americans were concerned, Amos and Andy had come into their homes and captured their hearts. It became an American institution. At broadcast time, the streets were practically deserted. Buses and streetcars were empty. And for 15 minutes in over 150 theaters across the country, the film on the screen was stopped and the radio turned on so the moviegoers could hear Amos and Andy. Amos and Andy appealed to young and old, to high and low. Ambassador Charles Dawes said to reporters on leaving for his post in England, I'm looking forward to my appointment, but my only regret is I shall miss my Amos and Andy. Even the sardonic George Bernard Shaw, who so loved to poke fun at American ways and customs, was impressed. There are three things I shall never forget about America. Niagara Falls, the Rocky Mountains, and Amos and Andy. Perhaps the greatest tribute of all paid to Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell was one night at a huge benefit in New York's Madison Square Garden. Lowell Thomas, the famous radio news commentator who preceded Amos and Andy for years on the air, was chosen to introduce the boys. I can think of few things likely to give me greater pleasure than to introduce your radio favorites. When I die, this would be my epitaph. Here lies the body of a man who was heard by millions of people who were waiting to hear Amos and Andy. Well, that was it. That was their success. The rest of the story is familiar to all of us. As the years went on, Amos and Andy made new changes in their program, the most significant being when they went from 15 minutes to a half hour. Changes come and go, but I'm sure you feel, as I do, that Amos and Andy have never left that wonderful place in our hearts. Now, before I turn you back to Ed Murrow, I'd like to say once more, as I did for so many years, this is Bill Hay bidding you all good night and good night to you all. Well, that's the story of Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll. The story of Amos and Andy. Two names that are sure to go down as part of American folklore. It's only fitting that tonight the entire radio industry gives special recognition to these two men. 
To pay this tribute, we have an event unique in broadcasting history. The heads of two great networks, David Sarnoff of NBC and William Paley of CBS, appearing on the same program to pay tribute to Amos and Andy. First, I would like to introduce the chairman of the board of the Radio Corporation of America and head of the National Broadcasting Company, General Sarnoff. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very proud to join hands with my friend Bill Paley, chairman of the board of Columbia Broadcasting System, in paying tribute to Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll, who created and portrayed the characters of Amos and Andy on radio for the past quarter of a century. I extend to you boys my highest regard and esteem for your brilliant and important pioneer work in the progress of radio broadcasting and for your faithful adherence to the highest ideals of good entertainment. We in the National Broadcasting Company are proud to have introduced this program to the listeners of America and to have broadcasted over our coast-to-coast -coast network for 15 years. Congratulations to you, Freeman, and to you, Charlie. And now the chairman of the board of the Columbia Broadcasting System, William S. Paley. I'm very happy to join General Sarnoff, whose leadership and contributions have meant so much to broadcasting, in paying tribute to Freeman Gosden and Charlie Correll. By bringing pleasure to millions of listeners for more than a quarter of a century, they have firmly established themselves in the affections of their fellow citizens. They have also created a great radio institution, one which I believe will live forever in the folklore of America. Freeman and Charlie, it gives me great pleasure to salute you, not only as an old friend, but also on behalf of the Columbia Broadcasting System and the countless millions of your devoted listeners throughout the country. Our warmest wishes go out to you both. This is Freeman Gosden again. Before we say goodnight, Charlie and I would like to thank everyone who appeared on our program tonight. But most of all, we want to extend our deep appreciation to you, our listeners, who have made it possible for us to start our 26th year on the air. Yes, that's right. Everything we've ever done, we owe to your loyalty and confidence. And good night. Remember, beginning tomorrow through February 28th, it's the special Amos and Andy sale at Rexall everywhere. And be sure to be with us at the same time next Sunday when your Rexall druggist will again present the Amos and Andy show transcribed and directed by Cliff Powell. Stay tuned for the Bing Crosby program, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. Kind of bad there at the end, huh? That was from the master tape, so a little... Uh, so, you know how that happens. Uh, somebody is running out of tape. The person who got this some initially, the, the reel of tape was ending, and they just got it on, whoop, and it was slipping on the other end, and it just went through there. Sorry about that. But this is a pretty fair show, wasn't it? Amos and Andy's life story. It's, um, it's something that you should have in your collection if you are a complete radio collector, right? <laughs> Someone wrote a letter to us this week and said, um, I'm, I'm looking for, um, uh, is, there, is there a club of people who, uh, who get the radio shows, who collect the radio shows? I enjoy your program a lot, they said. And, uh, but is there a, play, a club where people get together and they talk about the radio shows and uh, uh, where they can just uh, enjoy things and, and do all of that stuff? And I was thinking about the reply that I might make to this person and say, and, and I guess I, I'm going to say that this is it. This is the club right here, Saturday afternoons from 1 to 5. Uh, we sit down and uh, talk about the radio shows. We don't open the telephone lines uh, on the air because we want to spend as much time as we can to um, provide you with the radio broadcast. 
But our lines are always open if you want to call us and talk about the radio things. And, of course, we do get together regularly at uh, Northwest Federal on Saturday evenings and other events, so we can always kick the old shows around. So um, I guess this is as close as you can come to having a, a radio club in the Chicago area. There were, there are some, there have been from time to time in the past groups of people who would meet um, every couple of months maybe for dinner and uh, and they'd have a speaker or they'd show a movie or they'd listen to radio tapes and talk about it. But, you know, I have always felt that radio itself is a very personal uh, kind of a thing. And it... Uh, uh, when you listen, you listen kind of by yourself. Uh, you don't listen in an auditorium or a room with six people even uh, to a radio program. It, you get restless doing that. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to listen to a radio show when there's five or six people sitting around the radio listening to it. Uh, even a large family in the old days, uh, six people might be listening to the radio. Six or eight people in a large family might be sitting around, might be around the radio listening, but they weren't listening as an audience would sit and listen uh, to a concert. They were listening as individuals to this. Uh, Dad might be in the chair with his newspaper in, a, in his lap, maybe picking up on some of the news as he was listening to the show. The mom might be mending some socks. You might be darning the socks. You know, remember that little, that little wooden ball on a stick that she used to put in the in the toe and the heel of the sock to, to mend the sock. And uh, the kids uh, each maybe would be working on a on a jigsaw puzzle on the floor or playing with tinker toys or an erector set. Or um, maybe uh, if it were me, I might be just lying on the floor in front of that radio with my head buried into my arms uh, just savoring all the pictures that the, the radio was providing uh, in my mind so radio is kind of a personal thing and uh, to get together in a group to listen to radio uh, it's not, it's not the same as it is right now as we're listening uh, to these shows these shows are brought to you every Saturday afternoon on WNIB in Chicago at FM 97. Our program is Those Were the Days. My name is Chuck Shaden. We're here to share with you the good sounds from uh, the good old days. Coming up now, in just a couple of minutes, we're going to have Stars in the Afternoon from 1946. This is a CBS program promoting the fall lineup of shows on the network for the 46-47 season. Even as uh, the networks today are getting ready to to uh, start their fall TV season. This is what the radio was doing back uh, 23 um, years ago. Oh, 23 years ago. Is that right? 46 to 79? 33 years ago. What happens to the time? Huh? We're going to hear Frank Sinatra, Dinah Shore, Durandy and Moore, Blondie, uh, the Crime Doctor, Screen Guild Players, The Thin Man, Casey, Crime Photographer, Sam Spade, Inner Sanctum, all little bits and pieces of so many of those shows. Then after that, that's about a 90-minute program, by the way. After that, we have Charlie McCarthy's 10th anniversary program, and then some uh, some more promotional sketches uh, with Baby Snooks and Daddy promoting the 1943-44 season on uh, CBS Radio. So I think it's uh, worth sticking around this afternoon, and uh, it's worth staying with us on uh, Saturdays all year round because coming up in September, what well, we're going to try again next week on the 8th of September and offer you some programs that were previously bumped because of, the, of one thing or another. And next week we're going to have Spike Jones and the Spotlight Review. We're going to have a, an interview with our special guest Pat O'Brien reminiscing about his career on the stage and the screen. Uh, we'll have a guest star performance with Pat O'Brien starring as a feisty Irish football coach. We'll have an Academy Award production of The Front Page with Pat O'Brien and Adolph Manju. And we'll have Jimmy Durante and Gary Moore on the Comedy Caravan. And, of course, uh, the Jurgens Journal with Walter Winchell. On the 15th of September, we're going to have a salute to Harlow Wilcox. We're going to have an afternoon of programs featuring Harlow Wilcox as the announcer. We have a Truth or Consequences broadcast, a suspense drama, The King's Men, which was a summer replacement for Fibber McGee and Molly. We'll have an Adventures of Frank Merriwell episode, Amos and Andy, a complete show, and... Uh, Finally, of course, uh, no uh, salute to Harlow Wilcox would be uh, complete without a, name, a, a Fibber McGee and Molly program. We'll have one from 1943. And on that particular show, Harlow Wilcox will play himself, 
and also his identical twin brother. It's going to be some fun. And on the 22nd and 29th of September, we're going to have some good old movies on radio. We're going to have radio versions of these movies, Magic Town with James Stewart, Shadow of a Doubt with Joseph Cotton, When My Baby Smiles at Me with Betty Grable, Lost Weekend with Ray Milland and Jane Wyman, Screen Director's Playhouse of The Sea Wolf, starring Edward G. Robinson. We'll have Jezebel with Betty Davis, The Jazz Singer with Al Jolson, and The House on 92nd Street with Lloyd Nolan and William Lundigan. We'll also have the um, 1945 Academy Awards broadcast. So, and our guest is going to be Bob Kolosowski, who will join us both Saturdays, the uh, 22nd and 29th of September, to talk about the good old movies on uh, radio and uh, on television, too. So I hope you'll stay with us all through September to enjoy the good things that we've got lined up. Now, all those good things are outlined in our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide, and you can subscribe right now if you'd like to uh, get in on this and uh, become a, a subscriber to the newsletter. Frank Sinatra in 1942, a very young-looking Mr. Sinatra, is on the cover of our newsletter for September, and that's just the beginning of the good reading that you'll find in this issue of our publication. A one-year subscription, 10 issues, is just $7. And you can subscribe right now when you call us at 545-2260. Now, the September issue features an original article by Otto Stack about Kenny Delmar, who was Senator Claghorn on the Fred Allen Show. Plus, we have reprint stories about the Aldridge family, about Jane Morgan, who played Mrs. Davis, Eve Arden's landlady on Our Miss Brooks. There's an article written by Kay Kaiser, telling how he became the professor of the College of Musical Knowledge. And there's an interesting story about the writer and the cast of I Love a Mystery, Carlton E. Morse's exciting adventure, and you'll find the good picture of the original Jack, Doc, and Reggie of the A1 Detective Agency. Call us at 545-2260 to subscribe. Now, a one-year subscription, $7. That's 545-2260. Our Nostalgia Newsletter gives you lots of information about movies and other special events at Northwest Federal, plus the complete listing of our Saturday afternoon uh, broadcast schedule here on WNIB. You get information about all the shows we play every week, including original broadcast dates, names of stars and other cast members, network and sponsor identification, even the length of time of each segment that we present to help you record these shows for your own collection. So why don't you subscribe right now to our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide. We'll begin your subscription with the September issue, which you'll get by first-class mail at the beginning of the week, and we'll include an invoice along with your first issue. Call 545-2260. If the lines are busy when you call, we sure will appreciate it if you'd wait just a moment and then dial back at 545-2260. Or if you like, simply send $7 to Nostalgia Newsletter, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. But why not give us a buzz now while you're thinking about it this afternoon? Call 545-2260 to subscribe to our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide. 545-2260. <laughs> Remember Henry Ford's Model T? Remember cranking up the motor to start the car? And remember the Model A with the self-starter? Great memories, huh? Well, Ralph Hirschberg of Nelson Hirschberg Ford has found memories, too. Memories that roll back to 1931, when he and Norm Nelson first started selling Fords on Irving Park Road. Today, Ralph and Jurgen and all the folks at Nelson Hirschberg Ford remember one other thing, that during all those years, the Ford owner who comes again to get his new Ford from Nelson Hirschberg is the Ford owner who's been treated with old-fashioned respect and courtesy, not only when he buys that new Ford, but while he owns it, too. Thousands of Ford owners come back again and again to do business with Nelson Hirschberg, one of Chicagoland's oldest, most respected Ford dealers. Find out for yourself. Get your new Ford from an old-fashioned dealer. Visit Nelson Hirschberg Ford, 5133 Irving Park Road, five blocks west of Cicero at Laramie. This is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program, WNIB in Chicago at FM 97. Now we have an hour and a half, uh, yeah, an hour and a half program for you that was presented on the Columbia Broadcasting System Radio Network on uh, September 22nd of 1946, almost exactly 23, 33 years ago. 
See, I keep wanting to chop 10 years off of that. We'd all like to do that, wouldn't we? <laughs> this was an all-star program. It was uh, had a little bit of a theme running through it, but the idea of the program was to let the, uh, the country know what excitement they could look forward to if they set their dial at CBS for the, um, the season ahead. So if you were in Chicago, you were listening to the WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago. Now this was post-war. It was uh, We were out of the war now for about a year, and things were really uh, starting to hum. And this is uh, at a point now, as far as radio is concerned, and as far as I'm concerned, where they had the technique of radio broadcasting really perfected, and they knew what they were doing, and they were really, really rolling into, into uh, uh, broadcasting uh, uh, expertise. So I think you're going to enjoy this program. We have all kinds of big stars from, NB from CBS on this program, and we've got this for you in, uh, in six segments, each approximately 15 minutes, uh, some a little more, some a little less, but it's, it runs an hour and a half, and we'll start off right now with part one, of Stars in the Afternoon. This is Columbia, CBS. From border to border, from east to west, you've learned your dials and how to twist them when you twist them with the Columbia system. Week after week, year after year, here's where you hear what you want to hear. Question this statement? Stick around. This is the biggest show in town. <laughs> The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Stars in the Afternoon, a 90-minute preview of the biggest show in town, which again this year is yours for the dialing, over the 159 CBS stations from coast to coast. In the next hour and a half, you'll hear Jimmy Durante and Gary Moore, the Family Hour with Patrice Munsell and Jack Smith, the Thin Man with Claudia Morgan and Les Damon, Bob Hawk, Blondie with Dagwood and Hanley Stafford, Hoagie Carmichael, Ralph Morgan for the Screen Guild Players, Vaughn Monroe and his music, House Jameson is the Crime Doctor, American Melody Hour with Bob Hannon and the Knightsbridge Choir, Stats Cotsworth as Casey, crime photographer, It Pays to be Ignorant with Tom Howard, George Shelton, Harry McNaughton and Lulu McConnell, Howard Duff as Sam Spade, Gene Hirschholt as Dr. Christian, Ann Southern as Maisie, Peter Lind Hayes, Paul McGrath as host of the Inner Sanctum, and William Keeley presents Virginia Bruce for Lux Radio Theater. Let's go Who? Frank Sinatra. Would you spell it, please? S I N A. What was the first letter? S. S is in sweetheart. As in what? Sweetheart. S W. S what? W. W as in wife. I didn't get that last word. I'm so sorry. Wife, Dinah. W I F. W I what? F as in fool. As in what? Fool. F double O L. Double O what? L. L as in left. L-E-F-T. Oh, well, I'm sorry I didn't catch the last letter. T as in town. Brown. Brown. Town, you know, Dinah, like city. Like what? City. C-I-T. What was that first letter again, please? C. C as in come. D as in dumb? Yes. No, I mean no. As in come. C-O. C. C what? O as in over. Oh, over. Now you've got it. Shall I read it back? Read what back? Sweetheart, fool, wife, left town, come over. <laughs> Will you pull yourself together, kid? To whom is the telegram going, please? Dinah, will you quit gagging? I'm a wreck. A wreck? Oh, it's Frankie. Frankie. <laughs> well, see, this is a coincidence. I was just going to 
telephone you. No wonder you didn't know who I was. Say, did you hear that list of big CBS names that are going to be on the Columbia Network in the next hour and a half? Nats, and I got news for you, hey. There's one name missing. Yeah. Mine. Mine. That's, That's what, what I'm I was calling, calling you about. about. Yeah, and since you and I are on Columbia every Wednesday night... Yeah, we ought to knock a couple of songs for them this yeah. afternoon. Something like, uh, they say that falling in love is wonderful. It's wonderful, so they say. See, that's the idea. They can't leave you out of that show, They Donna. can't leave you Get out of that show, Get your hat, and I'll meet you down at Columbia okay, Broadcasting. Frank. We'll talk personally to Mr. Sisson. Okay, I'll see you in a minute. Good afternoon, Columbia Broadcasting, Mr. Sisson's office. This is Greta, his secretary, speaking. No, Mr. Sisson is very busy. Uh, pardon me, miss. Uh, well, what can I do for you two? We'd like to see Mr. C.B. Sisson. Oh, well, he's too busy to see anyone. Come back next week. But we're a couple of singers, and we... Come back next year. Hey, look, sister, would you believe me if I told you this girl is Dinah Shaw and I'm Frank Sinatra? Look, brother, would you believe me if I told you I'm Greta Garbo? Would it get us in to see Mr. Sisson if we did? Uh, what do you think? Pleased to, to meet, meet you, Miss Garbo. <laughs> Go right in. Gee, I wonder if I do look like Garbo. Yeah. Mr. System? Yeah, my friends call me CB. Hello. How do you do? My name is... Well, uh, we've long introductions out of this. I'm a very busy man with very little time. But we're having to stop every half hour to tell people what station they're whistling to. <laughs> they didn't know. What's your problem? Well, briefly, uh, briefly, huh? <laughs> Mr. S., we sing. And we thought maybe you could use a little romantic warbling on that show. Romantic warbling? Yeah, listen, I want you to know this little girl here. She's Dinah, and there's nobody finer from the coast to Catalina. A uh, Frank Sinatra, open your golden trout. See, thanks, Dinah. Together, we'd knock out a rather fair romantic ballad. Sure. Tonight. Sorry, but right now, I'm in the mood for whaps. You haven't heard me sing. I haven't time to experiment. <laughs> right now, I want to listen to Jimmy Duante and Gary Moore. That's a boy and a girl. <laughs> Silence. Just listen. <laughs> Yes, my friends, it's the nose and the haircut. And to start the ball rolling, we bring you, with no strings attached, a young man who has a voice like a violin with no strings attached. And here he is, Gary Moore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob Lamont. <laughs> Thank you. I... <laughs> Thank you very much. That... Oh, really, that's enough applause now, really. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Tismo, that's enough. You can turn the record off now. Turn the record off, Mr. Tismo. <laughs> really, Mr. Tismo, it's a shame your parents weren't the type to devour their young. <laughs> but... But in any event, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very happy September the 22th to you all. I, I want you to know it's a real kick to be celebrating another great season of CBS programs. Of course, I haven't been on the air since CBS started, but I have been in radio since 1935, fixing battery sets and things like that. And it's, it's always a thrill to see how radio has grown up in that time. Gee whiz, you take this, this magnificent studio here, for instance. Do you realize that at this very moment, ladies and gentlemen, you are sitting in washed air? I really mean that. If you look up there, you'll see some little grates on the front of the studio. You see up there? Well, Mr. William Paley, the president of the Columbia Broadcasting Company, sits up in there during the whole program and washes each piece of air that comes, in the, <laughs> comes into the studio. And it's not, only, it's not only cool in here, it's clean, too. Well, they tell me that nowadays, particularly this studio, is completely antiseptic. We have germ-proof microphones, hermetically sealed control rooms, sterilized musicians, and... and <laughs> And before every program, we boil the announcers. 
You've got to admit that's a lot better than having the announcers go out and get boiled on their own. Or is... <laughs> oh, come now, Gary. You haven't really been in radio as long as you like to make out. I haven't, Bob. <laughs> Why, bless your little station identification. <laughs> I, I started out, Bob, I started out at the age of 19 as a singer with a very famous quartet. You've, uh, you've heard of High Low Jack and the Dame? Yes. I sang with Mo, Joe, Schnook, and the boy. Uh, Gary, you were the boy. I was the schnook. It was, it was a, great, a great outfit, as I recall it. We appeared for eight straight weeks in the rose room of our local livery stable. We were, we were right in there pitching. <laughs> well, well, Gary, tell me one thing more. <laughs> Gary, you may have been in radio for 11 years, but uh, did you have any sponsors? Sponsors? Why, Bob, don't be ridiculous. You lost. My first... <laughs> My, my first sponsor, as I recall, was a really delightful little, little product called Mother Marie's No Wheeze, But Plenty of Breeze Cheese. <laughs> the great little thing was the only cheese I've ever seen that was so strong the mice had to back into the trap. <laughs> as, as I recall it, Bob, Mother Marie's No Wheeze, But Plenty of Breeze Cheese came to you in six delicious flavors. Super delicious, very delicious, plain delicious, fairly delicious, not so delicious, and... <laughs> it, was, it was a very, very, very happy association Okay, so that covers local radio But uh, how did you get to be a star? Well, Bob, that was just plain luck I was holding down a very poorly paid job in New York at the time I was master of ceremonies in a jukebox When fate <laughs> When fate leaned down and slugged me on the head with a golden wand At least I thought it was a wand until I looked up and surely enough, it was the nose himself, the one and only Jimmy Durante. Got off the cave with a song. Now, even when things go wrong, why, you feel better. You even look better. Stop the music. Stop the music. Stop the music. I refuse to work on the same stage with an orchestra that looks so untidy. <laughs> Jimmy, what do you mean? What's so untidy about the orchestra? There's a hair in that fiddle player's bow that hasn't been combed. <laughs> That's the essence of social barbarism. <laughs> well, anyhow, I'm, I'm glad you made it to the show on time, Schnauz. And I'm glad to see you too, Junior. You're so tried and true, so brave and blue, so lum and abner. <laughs> but Garrison, what a hectic time I had getting ready for this appearance. Yeah? I was sitting at home the other night, wearing my diving suit. You see, I have a sunken living room. <laughs> no. When I get the call from the president of CBS, he says, Durante, we'd like you to appear on our all-star show, if you think you're educated enough. Oh, he didn't, Jim. What did you say to that? What could I say? To impress him with my intelligence? I nonchalantly spelled out cat. K-A-T-E. <laughs> K-A-T-E, but it's not. That spells Kate. Kate is a girl's name. I happen to know this cat better than you do, Mr. Moore. <laughs> but anyway, no sooner do I accept the invitation to appear than I'm surrounded by a quandary. I haven't got a suit that's fit to wear to the broadcast. Uh-oh. So early this morning, Junior, I runs around on my tailor, Rimpsy Rappaport. <laughs> Rimsky Rappaport, <laughs> and I says, Rappaport, you gotta make me a suit within three hours. So we went to work with a vengeance. Well, the suit looks wonderful on you, Jim. But what's uh, what's that lump in the back? That's Rappaport. He's still working. <laughs> <laughs> Don't come out, Rimsky. You're not allowed in here without a ticket. <laughs> Well, in any event, Giacomo, I'm glad you made it. And uh, now that you're here, what are we going to do on this auspicious occasion? Well, Junior, I thought maybe we could do something high class and classical. Something like the shampoo song from the barber of uh, Schlemiel. <laughs> it's all very fancy schmancy, but really, old boy, do you think, um, do you think you're a quit? Are you Josh and Junior? I'll admit I didn't always know about music. Why, when I was seven years old, I couldn't tell a trombone from a hole in the wall. So I studied and studied for ten years, and now... Yes? I'm the only man in the world. Say that again. I said, yes. <laughs> Will you bring, bring Mr. Durante the script with a neon typing on it? Just a minute. 
You, you know... You said we were seven years old. You know, they can make mistakes in a script department. <laughs> Are you Josh and Junior? I'll admit I didn't always know about music. You did. Why, when I was seven years old, I couldn't tell a trombone from a hole in a wall. So I studied and studied for ten years, and now... Yes? I'm the only man in the world who can play a hole in the wall. Congratulations. Uh, after I changed it, it sounded a little better. <laughs> I'm ashamed of you, partner, why you're talking to a man who's got music in his blood, which explains why my nose is shaped like a G cleft. <laughs> well, that's all very well, Jim, but offhand, I can't recall any classics that are arranged for a hole in the wall. That means that we'd have to sing today, and that, you know, is out. Well, not of a necessary necessary. <laughs> I, I told you I got music in my blood, and I have. My uncle was a famous basso, and my aunt was a soprano. Basso? She certainly was, but she had a fine voice. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Jim. If you insist on music, you sing by yourself. Meanwhile, I should retire to the outskirts of Finland and listen for the finish. That's what I like about my... <laughs> That's what I like about my boy. He's got so much faith in me. But I never let an audience down. Maestro, music for that radio concert, the beaut of that enamel barrel tone... James Durante, my song for tonight, Chloe. Ladies and gentlemen, la ladies and gentlemen, I should like to announce, as long as I'm here anyway, I should like to announce that Mr. Durante has sung this song many times before, but tonight he has had his nose lifted so that those of you in the balcony may hear him too. <laughs> Carry on, James. Mr. Moore, you can let the audience draw its own concussions. <laughs> We begin, we begin again, Maestro Gluskin. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I forgot to tell you, but after tonight's performance, Mr. Durant, he will also be available for fish fries, weenie roasts, and the unveiling of better class manhole covers. <laughs> Excuse me, Jeff. I wouldn't interrupt again if I was you, partner. That's liable to lead to a fruit. <laughs> we begin again, Maestro Gluskin. <laughs> Just one other thing, friends. I, I forgot to tell you that Mr. Durante's selection to, uh, today is entitled Chloe. Okay, Jim. My boy is tinkering with immediate oblivion. We'll begin again, Maestro Gluskin. <laughs> oh, Jim, Jim, what's the matter? It's no use, Junior. I'm a failure. Well, why, Jim? What's wrong? Now I can't remember the first word. <laughs> Wasn't that terrific? That's what radio listeners will we want. Well, Dinah and I agree with that, Mr. System. Sure we do, but, but what about romantic music? No, laugh. But everybody doesn't want to laugh. Sometimes people would like to hear a boy and a girl sing. I guess that's what people would like to hear once in a while. And we'll get back to this uh, Stars in the Afternoon broadcast in just a moment. That's Arthur Q. Bryan, by the way, as Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. System, Mr. Columbia Broadcasting <laughs> System there. This is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program on WNIB in Chicago at FM 97. Well, I told you that our memory movies resume tonight, Saturday night at Northwest Federal Savings with the Laurel and Hardy double feature at 8 o'clock tonight. But something very special is beginning next Friday night at Northwest Federal. <laughs> Ten exciting Alfred Hitchcock films will be shown this fall during Northwest Federal Savings Friday Night Film Festival, which begins next Friday, September 7th at 8 o'clock p.m. in the Northwest Federal Community Center Auditorium at 4901 West Irving Park Road in Chicago. Bob Kolosowski, our uh, Those Were the Days resident film buff, will be on hand to introduce each movie and to offer background information on the making of the films and the career of Alfred Hitchcock. Donation is $2 per person, and proceeds go to recognized charities. Now, we do not have advanced tickets for this series, 
You can purchase your admission right at the door, and the doors open every Friday at 7.30. Now, here's the lineup of Hitchcock films to be shown. This Friday, we begin with The Lodger, a 1925 silent film. It's Hitchcock's third picture, a Jack the Ripper thriller, and it's a good one, too. In the uh, following weeks, we'll have Blackmail from 1929, his first talking picture. On the 21st of September, The Man Who Knew Too Much from 1934. This is the original version of the film which stars Peter Lorre. Then Sabotage, Secret Agent, Young and Innocent, The Lady Vanishes, Foreign Correspondent, Saboteur, and Shadow of a Doubt. Ten great Alfred Hitchcock films shown on Friday evenings beginning this Friday, September 7th at 8 o'clock at Northwest Federal's Irving Park Community Center Auditorium. Tickets are $2 per person per film. Purchase them at the door. No need to buy tickets in advance for this particular series. We'll be there Friday night, and we hope that you will join us for the first program in the Alfred Hitchcock Film Festival. And we'll be there to say to you, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And it should be a very good series, too. I hope you'll be able to join us for all or some of those Alfred Hitchcock films. Well, before, we were talking about um, about a club to where people get together to talk about radio. And uh, while there really, to our knowledge, isn't any real formalized uh, club, we did get a call from Jim Beadle, who says that, uh, hey, Chuck, there is a, uh, a get-together once a week for for people who have amateur radios. The hams get together every Sunday morning at 8 o'clock on their amateur radio band, and they get together and talk about old-time radio. The group is called Orcats, O-R-C-A-T-S, S, O-R-C-A-T-S, which means old radio collectors and traders. Now, these are people who collect the radio programs and they, uh, they talk about them. And he says they, people call in on the short wave or on their amateur radio uh, from all over the country, from New York and from Michigan and from Tennessee and every place. And they get together at the stroke of 8 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Now, if, so if you have an amateur radio or possibly a short wave radio, you might be able to pick up on this. And I'll tell you where to find it. If you've got a pencil, you want to take this down. So if you, if you have a shortwave radio or a ham radio or an amateur radio, you might like to, you can join the club. You can join, you are absolutely can join the club. I guess there are no dues, <laughs> except that you've got to be there Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock when they get together on the shortwave band and talk about old-time radio. And they say, well, I've got a copy of Jack Benny from such and such a date. I'll send it to you over here. And they go through this whole number. And I think it's really kind of nice because it's all done on radio. Now, they don't play any radio things. It's illegal to play radio broadcasts on the amateur band radio. It's illegal, I guess, to have any kind of uh, commercial programming on that. But they do this every Sunday morning at 8 o'clock. And you, uh, you'll you jump in, and, uh, and uh, all you got to do is be there, I guess. All right, it's, uh, if you've got your pencil handy, this is what happens. It's at 7.248 megahertz on the 40-meter amateur band, and it's on the lower side band. Now, I'm not a, uh, an amateur radio operator at all, and this doesn't, this doesn't mean an awful lot to me, but if you are, you'll know what I'm talking about. And I'll repeat this now. Sunday morning at 8 o'clock, 7.248 megahertz on the 40 meter amateur band on the lower side band on the sunny side of the street the orcats o r c a t s s <laughs> i can't do it old radio collectors and traders getting together uh, so that's pretty good I just it'd you be know, fun to get a hold of a, one of these shortwave radios just to find out what's going on. Now maybe you know somebody if you don't have one. Maybe you know someone. Now he, uh, uh, Jim Beadle called and he said that uh, if it's possible to pick them up on shortwave, you got to diddle around a little bit there because you may not be able to get them precisely at this point on the shortwave radio. And if you know what I'm talking about, then you know what I'm talking about because I don't know what I'm talking about. 
That's like, that's a Costello routine. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Who's on first? <laughs> okay, now let's get back to Frank Sinatra and Dinah Shore and Mr. System on Stars in the Afternoon. You know a little bit about a lot of things. But you don't know enough about us. For people who like music, we got things like the family hour. The family hour? Yeah. What about the boy and girl who still haven't raised a the family? They can listen, too. <laughs> listen and learn. I'll get the family hour now, so you listen. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon. This is Frank Gallup welcoming you to the family circle. Again, the curtains are drawn back on the family at home, and you're invited to share with us a typical Sunday afternoon musical vignette. Accompanied by Al Goodman and his famous orchestra, Patrice Munsell sings Sempre Libre from La Traviata, and Jack Smith and the male chorus sing Rica Pulpa. <laughs> Capulpa de Tamarindo La treo es seco pero en su tablero para vender Pulpa, rica pulpa Es mi pulpa más sabrosa que la miel Pulpa, la pulpa de unos labios que curaron mis agravios con mi pulpa fue mi café en tu canto yo la paentera con azúcar de mi pulpa rica pulpa que es tan dulce como besos de mujer pulpa rica pulpa Casa rica, rica, pulpa de Samaringo por Pulpa, rica, pulpa. Es mi pulpa más sabrosa que la mía, y cual la pulpa. Pulpa, rica, pulpa. Rica, pulpa, que es tan dulce como besos de mujer. Pulpa, rica, pulpa. Ay, casa rica de mi vida, mi chica es bonita, consentida, de decir, y pulpa. Rica pulpa, como beso de
My gracious, wasn't that lovely? Yes, it was. We loved every minute of it, didn't we, Dinah? Absolutely. Now, <laughs> now about a boy and girl singer in a romantic little interlude. Yeah. For instance, I say to Dinah... Yeah. Love is the only thing. The one and only thing. Yes, Mr. S. Love is a song and smiles and kisses. And laughter floating on long, lazy dreams. If you yes. think that's what love means, Mr. Sinatra, you should listen to Blondie. Blondie? Uh -huh. What's Blondie got to do with love and romance? Miss Shaw, the whole story of Blondie and Dagwood started on a long, lazy dream. But love isn't all peaches and cream. Love is winning to ways with two kids together. Real love is like this. <laughs> I see you. Hey, uh, what are we having for dinner tonight, honey? Sauerkraut. <laughs> oh. Oh, my. And kiss me first and ask about dinner later. It, oh, yeah. After all, which is more important, me or sauerkraut? It, yeah, well, uh, Blondie, I ought to kiss you first just the same. Well, I should hope so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Dagwood. Uh, tell me, did you get Mr. Dithers to give you that raise? Uh, what raise is that? The one you didn't get yesterday. Oh, oh, oh yes, that one. Yes, yeah. that one. You know, Mr. Dithers has been promising you for ages. Well, didn't you ask him? What happened? Uh, well, he saw me coming, and before I could ask for a raise, he asked me if I would be willing to take a cut. Oh, oh, Dagwood. Hello, Daddy. Did you get the raise? It, huh? Oh, uh, mm. Uh, no, I didn't, Cookie. Oh, gee, Daddy. I was counting on you. Yeah. I guess I'll have to wear these same old ribbons in my hair. Uh, oh. Uh, well, I tried, Cookie. I tried. But you told Alexander and me that a bumstead could do anything that was humanly possible. Well, Mr. Ditters isn't human, so it isn't possible. <laughs> Oh, Dagwood, we really need that raise. Things are so high in the stores, I must have more grocery money. Uh, uh, well, uh... And I ought to have more allowance. It's terrible what I have to pay for bubble gum. <laughs> okay, okay, this time I'm going to be tough with Mr. Diddy. Good. Tomorrow morning I'm going to demand that raise. Demand nothing. You're going down there and ask for it, like a man. <laughs> It's Dagwood Bumstead, your valuable and brilliant assistant. Come in, BB Brain. Uh, good morning, Mr. Diddy. No comments. Uh -huh. Well, Bumstead, what's on that tiny, tiny thing we loosely refer to as your mind? <laughs> <clears throat> Mr. Diddy, I want you to give me. My answer is no. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, but, Mr. Diddish, you didn't even know what I was going to say. I heard you say give, and that was enough for me. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, how do you know I wasn't going to ask you to give me permission to introduce you to a gorgeous girl who's dying to be your secretary, huh? Oh, well. <laughs> ah, go ahead and ask me that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Diddish, I want you to give me permission to ask you... Huh? To give me a raise. Bumps Ah. 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 Oh, that awful cattle. Ah. Ah. You sound like the mating call of a Rhode Island ring. Ah. Now get back to your desk. Mr. Diddy, I want to discuss that race. Bumstead, you're going back to your desk. Oh, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, yes, I am. Oh, no, you're not. Bumstead, cut that out. You get back to your desk or I'll run your little finger through the pencil sharpener. <laughs> Mr. Diddy, there are other construction companies who are looking for good men. That has nothing to do with you. Yeah. And if I don't get that raise, I'm going to quit. 
Oh. So you'd quit. You'd run out on me for a few paltry dollars, yeah. all covered with germs. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's all you care for, poor old Dizzy. Oh, now, 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 wait a minute, Mr. Dizzy. After Dizzie. the way I've treated you two, why, the Dithers Company has been like a mother to you. Uh -huh. Just like a mother. And I've watched over you and helped you along and tried to do my best for you. And this is the gratitude I get. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, Mother. Uh, 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 Mr. Dick. I thought you were the one person whose loyalty I could count on. Uh, yes. Well, you can, Mr. Dittis. Okay. I don't need that raise. Oh, Dagwood. Dagwood, old friend. Mr. Dithers, can I let you have a little money? Let's not overdo it, buddy. Oh, come in. Mr. Dithers, I've been listening outside the door, so let's get back to that raise again. Blondie, please. Dagwood and I were discussing this on a very high plane. Yeah, yeah well, Blondie, I, I didn't know you were out there. Mm. Well, Dagwood, I don't think Mr. Dithers realizes how much we need the money. Come on in, Cookie, and say hello to Mr. Dithers. Hello, Mr. Dizzy. Why, hello, Cookie. Why, the child's in rags. She's wearing nothing but rags. Well, that's right, Mr. Dizzy. And it's getting cold, too, Mr. Dizzy. And we don't feel that Dagwood's asking too much, Mr. Dizzy. Nothing but rags. Why, this is shocking. Bumstead, ah. you should have demanded that I give you a raise. Oh, you coward. <laughs> You should have choked me until I gave you the money you needed. Well, if you insist, just put your neck right in here. No, no, no. <laughs> I'll give you the raise without the massage. Now go out and get some decent duds for this poor child. Uh, oh, well, uh, thank you, J.C. Well, go, come on, Blondie and Cookie, come on. Oh, Mr. Dithers, thank you so very much. Thank you, Mr. Dizzy. It's all right, but the name is Dithers. Yes, Mr. Dizzy. <laughs> Now get those clothes. Oh, yes, sir. Hey, hey, Blondie, what, what is this? Well, Mr. Dithers tried a sob story on you, so I tried one on him. And I got the raise, didn't I? Yeah, but well, where did we get these clothes Cookie's wearing? Uh, wh wh where'd they come from? Oh, I'm taking her to a costume party, and fortunately, she decided to go as Raggedy Ann. <laughs> Great, great, Mr. System, great. Just peachy dandy. Yeah, Frank and I agree with you that that's love, but we stand for romance. We stand for dreams. We stand for stardust. Would you we... stand for Hoagie Carmichael? Hoagie's, Hoagie's one, one of my, my better, better friends. friends. Of course, well, here's Hoagie Carmichael at the piano. Well, what do you know? Hi, everybody. Frank and Dinah and a deep bow to that old CB system. You know, this is sort of a personal preview for me because, well, just four weeks from this Sunday afternoon, I'll be right here on this network, sitting where I like to sit most, at the piano with Georgia on my mind. Georgia. Georgia. The whole day through Just an old sweet song Keeps Georgia on my mind Georgia on my mind Each day, Georgia, my honey A song of you Comes a sweet and clear as moonlight through the pines. Other arms reach out to me. Other eyes smile tenderly. Still in peaceful dreams I see The road leads back to you To you, my pretty Georgia Beautiful Georgia No peace I find Just 
an old sweet song keeps Georgia on my mind. Loved every minute of it, Hoagie, didn't we, Dinah? You speak for me, Frank. Shh, please, silence. Silence? Why? I'm listening for my cue. What cue? Every half hour, I tell the listeners what network they're listening to. Why? Why? I don't know. It's a wool in radio. <laughs> you mean you're the man who No, 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 no. Don't, don't the... say it. Don't. You'll wouse up the network. You're wooing me. I gotta wait for my cue. Now, listen. Stars in the afternoon. A preview of the biggest show in town will continue for another full hour after a brief pause for station identification. Come in, Mr. System. Yes, sir. <clears throat> This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. That's a, that's a rousing end to the first half hour of Stars in the Afternoon on CBS uh, back on September 22nd of 1946 as they... Uh, step forward with their best foot to tell you about all the good shows that they've got lined up for the 1946-47 season. And there's another, uh, about an hour of this to go yet. And we'll have it right here on WNIB in Chicago at FM 97. This is Chuck Shaden telling you not to touch that dial because after that we have the Charlie McCarthy Show, Edgar Bergen's 10th anniversary. And then from 1943, Baby Snooks and Daddy We'll be giving us some uh, preview looks at some of the 1943-44 season on uh, CBS. By the way, Daddy on the Baby Snooks program was played by Hanley Stafford, who was also Mr. Dithers on the Blondie program, whom you heard a little earlier, Mr. Dizzy. Uh, they were calling him on that uh, particular show. I'm Chuck Shaden, and we have a lot of good things for you. And as I look up the old calendar on the wall, we see that this is the first of September. So we have a brand new month and we have a brand new cassette tape of the month. Now for September we have for you something very very special. An all-star Armed Forces Radio Command performance broadcast of Dick Tracy in B flat. Who's that knocking at my door? Who's that singing troubadour, bringing song to my boudoir? It is I, Dick Tracy. <laughs> How I love your square-cut chin. I'll come down and let you in. Hiya, Dick, give me some skin. Thanks. You scared Tess through heart. <laughs> well, the big day, huh, Tess? We're finally going to get married. Yes, Dick, and this time you better go through with it. I've waited 13 years to get married, and you keep putting it off. Well, honey, some big crime keeps coming up, and I have to dash out and solve it. In 1941, it was 88 Keys. In 1942, it was Mrs. Mrs. Pruneface. And in 1944... Wait a minute. What happened to 1943? Very interesting year. My laundry came back. <laughs> But I know I don't have to worry about you, Tess Trueheart, because your heart is true. My heart will always be true, but if we don't get married pretty soon, the rest of me may stray a little. <laughs> <laughs> That's from Dick Tracy in B-flat, an all-star command performance broadcast from February 15th of 1945. It has never been heard on commercial radio. It was only for Armed Forces Radio. Of course, we've played it. Uh, a number of times over the past several years, and we've always gotten such tremendous response that when we discovered it was available in a cassette form, we thought we just had to have it for you. And it is yours for just $5 from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053, our September cassette special. Listen to this cast. Bing Crosby stars as Dick Tracy. Dinah Shore as Tess Trueheart. Jerry Colonna is the police chief. Bob Hope is flat top. Frank Morgan is Vitamin Flintheart. Jimmy Durante is the Mole. Judy Garland is Snowflake. The Andrews Sisters appear as the Summer Sisters. Cass Daly is Gravel Gertie. And Frank Sinatra is Shaky. 
It's a great hour of classic radio entertainment, and it's our cassette tape for September. $5 from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Or you can get this tape at any office of Northwest Federal Savings, or when you visit our Metro Golden Memory Shop at 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Dick Tracy and B-flat, a command performance from Armed Forces Radio, 1945. Now, also this month, we offer you the most famous radio broadcast of all time. It's Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air production of the H.G. Wells classic, The War of the Worlds, an hour-long program, exactly as it was broadcast 41 years ago in 1938. It's yours this month for $5 from the Hall Closet, and you can also pick it up at any Northwest Federal or at the MGM shop. Now, if you'd like both tapes, Dick Tracy and B-flat plus The War of the Worlds, Send $10 to the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Two great cassettes this month. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where plenty of free parking makes it a pleasure to shop your favorite store or service. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where Eden's Expressway, Skokie Boulevard, and Lake Avenue meet at Womat. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center. Easy to reach, easy to park, easy to shop. Back to school values all this week at Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, Will Met. This is Chuck Shaden. Those were the days, WNIB Chicago, FM 97. Now we continue with uh, Stars in the Afternoon from 1946. You were just wonderful. Oh, I'm glad oh, I just heard what network it was. Oh. I heard you just as plain as if I were in the next room, Gee. which I was. Oh, you were. The switchboard is simply flooded with calls. Oh, You're being deluged with compliments, really? showered with praise. You're the reigning favorite. I get it. He's all wet. Yeah. <laughs> now let me see. Where was I? I'll tell you where you were, sissy old boy. You were just about to put Dinah and me on your all-star show. And as we said, what your show needs, CB. Is romance. Why? 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 How about this? How do you like this? Yeah. That's a swell reading. A guy who asks why the world needs romance. What kind of a world would it be without a boy somewhere singing to a girl? I'll be loving you always. With a love that's true always. Well, I hope you'll be very, very happy. Please excuse me now. I got now look, creep. Without romance, there'd be very little to live for in this world. Romance is the very heart of all world progress. All dreamer. If you can't tell me anything about dreamer, we have the best on CBS. Why, when Monday night rolls around, I can hardly wait to hear this familiar theme. Take it away. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls? This is Ralph Morgan, Vice President of the Motion Picture Relief Fund, reminding you that the music you hear in the background is the theme of our Screen Guild players. We're extremely proud of it. When the Screen Guild players went on the air, it was only natural that we should choose motion picture music for our signature. The main theme from the Warner Brothers picture, Four Daughters. We like to think that the Screen Guild Players program has given this melody a wider life under the title Symphony Madame. production was introduced to the radio audience seven years ago, more than 350 famous stars and featured players have given their services and contributed their talents to this program. By doing this, they have helped to build and maintain the Motion Picture Relief Fund Country House and Clinic, 17 miles from Hollywood, 
in the famous San Fernando Valley. It is also your faithful and encouraging response to the plays of the Screen Guild players that has helped to make the country house and clinic possible. It is the earnest hope of the Motion Picture Relief Fund and its players that we may continue to entertain you for the benefit of those of the picture industry who may now or in the future need the comfort and service of the country house. On behalf of these, I thank you all very much. Consider that very, very nice, don't you, Mr. Uh... <laughs> I don't believe you told me your name. Only seven zillion times. I'm Frank Sinatra. Oh. This little girl is Dinah Shaw. How do you expect to put on a big special broadcast without a romantic boy and girl is a mystery to me. Mysteries, that's what I like. You do? Yeah. Oh, sweet mystery of life, at last I found you. you know, we got the best detectives in radio on our network. Yeah. <laughs> And here's a mystery so tremendous, terrific, and baffling that we're calling in all our star detectives to solve it. Listen. Calling all stars. Calling all stars. Crime doctor, the host of Inner Sanctum, Sam Spade, Casey crime photographer, the thin man, wake up and go at once to the home of Edward Dismukes Mayhoff, wealthy sportsman whose life has been threatened. Hurry on over. If you don't hurry, it'll be all over. Over. Yes, yes, who is it? Dr. Ordway, the crime doctor. Let me in. Oh, Dr. Ordway, I'm glad you're here. Read this, this note I got. Note? Yes, yes, they're going to kill me. They're after me. Save me. Help me, Dr. Ordway. Please be calm, Mr. Mayhoff. Just a moment now, let me read it. Nothing you can do will save you. You will be killed tonight. At midnight. <laughs> midnight. <laughs> and it's 23 minutes to 12 now. Don't let them save me. I'm too young to die. How old are you, Mr. Mayhaw? 86. <laughs> 86 going on 87, I hope. Well, I hope so, too. <laughs> now, this should be very easy to solve. First, you must answer a few questions. Oh, anything, anything. But we must hurry. It's 19 minutes to 12. Ask me anything. Well, uh, first, who sent this note? Who sent it? Yes, it's not signed. Very untidy way of doing business. Just a note that someone's going to kill you and nothing more. No signature, no date, no corpse. Come, come, Mr. Mayhoff. I must say you're not being very cooperative. Well, I'm sorry, Dr. Ordway. I, I know there should have been more clues, but uh, I only got the note a half an hour ago. I didn't know what I was doing. My life was at stake. A flimsy excuse. Well, I, I didn't know which way to turn. I, I called every detective I could think of. Why aren't they here? Oh, there's somebody now. Seventeen minutes left. Yes, yes. Who is it? How do you do, Mr. Mayoff? I'm Nick Charles, the thin man. Oh. This is my wife, Nora. Nora, darling, this is Mr. Mayoff. Uh, 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 how do you do, Mr. Mayoff? Oh. Excuse me. I'm so sleepy. I beg your pardon, madam. This is Mr. Mayoff. I'm Dr. Ordway. <laughs> Not the crime doctor. The same. Nora, darling, is Dr. Ordway, the crime doctor we listen to every Sunday night. Uh, do we? Yes, of course, baby. Dr. Ordway is the man who helps the police solve all those difficult crimes by brilliant deductions. Oh, yes. But isn't it strange, Nick? He's never been able to catch Johnny breaking into those thousands of store windows he's always coming out of. <laughs> oh, oh. So nice to see you, Doctor. Mind if I lie down? I'm so sleepy. Not at all. I hardly knew you with your eyes open. <laughs> Please, it's... It's 15 minutes to 12. My life is at stake. This, this note I got. Note? Yeah, yeah. What note, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, 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 the, the note threatening my life. Uh, Dr. Ordway has it. Here, Nick, have a look. Mm -hmm. What do you make of it? Nothing can help you. You die at midnight. Hmm, who sent this? Who sent it? I don't know. 
Don't know who sent it? No. No date, no signature. Come, come, Mr. Mayo. Exactly what I told him, Nick. If people must get threatening letters, the least they can do is supply us with some clue or other. Yes, you're so right, Dr. Ordway. Always making it as difficult as possible. Just a, just a bit 14 minutes Reminds me of the case we had a year ago last sponsor. Or was it the sponsor before that? Nora, darling, what sponsor was that? Oh, please, Nicky. Oh, yes, it was the sponsor of 1944. It was a late autumn night. The options were just beginning to fall. We had a client like this hapless man here. It's 13 minutes And this well, man received a unlucky. note that he was going to be killed at 9 o'clock. You need to find us at 12 uh, o'clock. This was specific host time for the repeat broadcast. By the way, do you have a repeat broadcast, Dr. Ordway? Oh, yes. Yes, keeps me up frightfully late. I'm mm. awfully sleepy, Nikki, darling. Oh, yes, baby. Well, anyway, when this man called me about the note, we took every precaution. We folded the doors, barricaded the windows. Oh. We had police on every foot of ground around the apartment. Oh. Police doors, electric eyes, burglar alarms. Every precaution known to criminology was taken to see that this man would not be killed at 9 o'clock. Yes, Mr. Charles. What happened to the man? He was killed. Okay. Uh, but not until 10 o'clock. We had all gone home. We were dead tired. He was dead and <laughs> we were tired. Uh, Nick, darling, please. It's 12 minutes to 12. Won't somebody do something? Oh. Mr. Mayhoff, I'm Casey, crime photographer. Oh, hold it. Uh, thank you. Look for it in the morning express. Uh, please, Mr. Casey, will you please do something? I got this note. They're going to kill me at midnight. Midnight? Yes. Can't wait till midnight. We've got to press at once. Play dead. I'll take one more. But I don't want to lie down on the floor. Well, take this couch. Oh, oh. oh, oh. Hello, beautiful. I'll take one of you, too. Excuse me, Flash. I'm Nick Charles, the thin man. This is my wife, Nora. Uh, oh. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Charles. I, I listen to you every Friday night. I should have known that was you lying there, Mr. Charles. <laughs> And I'm Dr. Ordway, the crime doctor. Well, glad to know you, doctor. I listen to you on Sunday nights. Thank you. Well, won't anybody say they listen to me on Thursday nights? <laughs> won't anybody listen to me tonight? <laughs> I'm going to be killed at midnight. Eleven more minutes. Well, it's quite a gathering of the crime crag. Of the crime crag. Of the crime crag. Quite a gathering. All we need now is Sam Spade. My name is Sam Spade. Where's the body? Oh, Mr. Spade, I'm so glad you came. But there's no body here. Nobody here? No. What are these people doing here? Oh, uh, Mr. Spade, my name is Dr. Rodway. This is Nick Charles and his wife, Nora. This is Casey, the crime photographer. We've all been called in on the case. Get going, you guys. I work alone. But, Mr. Spade, in nine minutes, I'm going to be killed. Nine minutes? Okay, I'll be back. Have a check ready. Oh, I'll give you anything, Mr. Spade. I'll, I'll give you any, anything, anything. Only save me. Save me. Here, here, read this note. Read it. Look. No notes. I want cash. But, yeah, but I'm, I'm going to be killed at 12 o'clock. Well, let's get it over with. I got my own broadcast to make tonight. Hold it. Thank you, Mr. Spade. Look for it in the Morning Express. Reminds me of a case we had sponsored before last. Remember, Nora? Nicky, it's late. I'm getting sleepier by the minute. Yes, Nicky, it's three minutes to 12. I'm sleepy. I need... Do something for me. Do something to save me. Yes? Who is it? Come in. Good evening, friend. Oh, <laughs> oh it's, it's, uh, it's the host from Inner Sanctum. What? No blood? You're just... You're, you're just in time. Just in time for murder, I hope. Uh, don't rush me. I've still got two minutes. <laughs> and what's the inner sanctum host doing here? He's no detective. He doesn't even know enough to oil the hinges on his door. Oh, it's Mr. Charles, the Sinatra of the Sleuth. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do, Mr. Host? Dracula of the detectives, Karloff of the killer cycles, vampire of the vacuum tubes, Bluebeard of the batteries, and tomboy of television to come? Flatterer. How is business down at your creek joint these Monday nights, Mr. Host? Oh, gory be, we're killing them. <laughs> Love to have you down some Monday night. Uh -huh. Would you like me for dinner? Uh -huh. On toast. <laughs> please, 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 fellas. It's just a few more seconds. Can't any of you do anything? Save me! Save me! <laughs> they got me! They... Oh! Hold oh, it. Don't fall. <laughs> Thank you. Look for it in the morning express. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. oh, blood. Goody. Murder. Well, they won't need me here anymore. Anything you say may be held against you. Uh, just a minute, Dr. Ordway. 
How do we know he's dead? Get a doctor. Let's make sure the corpus is delecti. Somebody looking for a doctor? I'm Dr. Christian. Oh, come in, Dr. Christian. Here you every Wednesday night. How's Judy? She's fine, thank you. And how's Mrs. Charles? Sleeping any better? Oh, she's doing fine, thanks. That's good. <clears throat> That'll be $5. $5? <laughs> well, that's my... Did you say $5? Yeah, that's my regular fee for calling on the sick. What's your regular fee for calling on the dead? I'm sorry, I don't understand. We think your patient is dead. So fast? Uh, I just got here. We think he was dead before we called you. My fee is still $5. Well, there's a chance he may not be dead. And if I find he's not, he'll pay you the $5. <laughs> Here he is. Very well. <clears throat> no pulse. No heartbeat. No blood. He's dead, isn't he, Doc? Not necessarily. <laughs> What do you mean? If a man has no pulse, no heartbeat, no blood, he's dead. That has been disproven. Who disproved it? Frank Sinatra. That's what I like. Give me a good chew of doer every time. And that's the uh, another segment of Stars in the Afternoon from September 22nd of 1946 with all those mystery stars together there and Dr. Christian analyzing <laughs> uh, Frank Sinatra, a dead man, huh? No blood, no pulse. <laughs> the skinny jokes were in full force for Frank Sinatra back in those days. Those were the days. Huh? This is Chuck Shaden with you every Saturday from 1 to 5 on WNIB in Chicago at FM 97. More of the stars in the afternoon coming up in just a moment. Well, you remember last Saturday afternoon we were talking about a special sale we had cooking at the Metro Golden Memory Shop. We have um, a sale on eight-track tapes of the good old radio shows. Our regular six-dollar hour-long eight-tracks are on sale for just three ninety-eight, And our regular two ninety-eight thirty-minute eight-tracks are on sale for only a dollar ninety-eight. That's a one-third saving on eight-track tapes of the vintage shows. Now, this is your last chance to pick up these at this special price because the sale ends tomorrow, Sunday, on, um, at our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Now, we have many titles on eight-track uh, of the old radio shows for you to choose from. Bergen and McCarthy, Fibber and Molly, Amos and Andy, Lum and Abner, Fred Allen, Inner Sanctum, Abbott and Costello, Suspense, The Life of Riley, Bing Crosby, Jack Benny, Captain Midnight, Gangbusters, The Whistler, Sam Spade. A lot of good things. It's an end-of-summer old-time radio 8-track sale. 60-minute 8-track tapes, usually selling for $6. This week at the MGM shop, just $3.98. And 30-minute 8-tracks, regularly $2.98, are going for only $1.98. Now's the time to really build your 8-track vintage radio tape collection. We have hundreds of 8-track tapes in stock, but this special sale is good only through tomorrow, Sunday, the 2nd of September. Now, we're open regularly Monday through Friday from 11 till 5. We'll be closed Labor Day, however. Saturday, today, we're open till 7.30 this evening. You can stop by at the uh, MGM shop on your way over to see the Laurel and Hardy double feature at Northwest Federal tonight, or stop in tomorrow, Sunday, from noon to 5. And uh, here's a reminder for cassette users, the cost of all of our old-time radio cassette tapes has increased, as of today, to $6.98 each. So um, the price is up because of the increasing cost. However, if you visit the MGM shop today or tomorrow, we'll still sell you the uh, cassettes uh, for $6. So we'll stretch it the September 1st deadline today and tomorrow only at the MGM shop, however. So it's a chance for you to pick up a, uh, a few extra dollars. You buy a half a dozen tapes, you save enough to get a seventh one uh, at the MGM shop. Metro Golden Memories, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Speaking of the uh, movie at Northwest Federal, tonight we're beginning our new season of memory movies with a good Laurel and Hardy double feature. Stan and Ollie star in Blockheads from 1938, plus on the same screen from 1939, Flying Deuces. 
In the Flying Deuces, by the way, um, uh, Stan and Ollie sing and dance to Shine On Harvest Moon, and there is nothing more charming than to see Stan and Ollie dancing and singing to a musical number, a very rare treat from so many of their, a number of their movies. In Blockhead, Stan has been marching in a trench for 20 years because nobody told him that the war was over, and that's World War I. Ollie brings him home to find that uh, Stan has not changed at all. You gotta love it. You'll see it tonight at the Memory Movie. Dollar and a quarter, that's the donation. Proceeds going to recognize charities. Doors open at 7.30. Our program begins at 8 o'clock. We'll be there tonight, and I hope that you will join us for this Laurel and Hardy double feature, Flying Deuces and Blockheads. Now let's continue on WNIB in Chicago with another segment of Stars in the Afternoon from 1946. Darn it, baby. Why do we bother with this creep? The only music he likes is Stone Cold Dead in the Market. <laughs> Listen, my thin friend, on CBS we got some of the best music in the world. Well, now we're getting somewhere, and that's what Frank and I are here for. We... Well, if you came here for good music, how about listening to Vaughn Monroe? Vaughn Monroe? You mean the man with the muscles on his vocal cords? That's the guy. He's on Columbia every Saturday evening, but I can get him for you right now. Oh, goody. <laughs> It's a pleasure to be on Mr. Systems Columbia Network, where we're surrounded by such good company. We're looking forward to being around these parts every Saturday night, and we've been polishing up some favorites for the occasion. Here's a little bit of medley the Moon Maids and I would like to sing to you and to Dinah Shore. That thin man Frankie can relax and eavesdrop. It's only a paper moon sailing over a cardboard sea. But it wouldn't be make-believe if you believed in me. Yes, it's only a canvas sky hanging over a muslin tree. But it wouldn't be make-believe if you believed in me. Without your love, it's a honky-tonk parade. Without your it's a melody played in a penny arcade. It's a Barnum and Bailey world, just as holy as it can be. But I wouldn't be make believe if you believed in me. Well, now, 
my young friends. How does your wife Monroe's singing? Great. And I like his doctrine, too. May I say that oh, I can... Yeah. <laughs> May I say that I consider that much worse than Hawaiius? Now, look, Dinah and I didn't come here to amuse you. The point we're trying to make is that you need us. Why? There's a spot in every show ever written where a boy and a girl are at the tag end of the day at the beach. They're sitting on a bench in the moonlight waiting for the last bus home, and he says... In our little pet house way up in the sky With hinges on chimneys for stars to roll by A sweet slice of heaven for just you and I Naughty Frankie, you know I believe in you, don't you? Honest, honey? Gee, that gives me a lot of confidence, darling. Confidence to ask you... Ask you something that, uh, well... Yeah. Well, I'm listening, Frankie, and I think you know the answer. Well, okay, honey. Put your head on my shoulder. Okay. That's right. I look up at that great, big, old, knocked-out moon. Yeah. And I'll try to ask you what I've been trying to ask you all evening. Yes, Frankie? Well, here goes. Have you got bus fare home? <laughs> Please, what exactly are you two doing? We're giving you sort of a digest version of what we mean by boy and girl romance. Well, the only digest versions I'm interested in right now is the digest version of Ann Seven's Maisie. Every Friday night on CBS, it's Maisie. As far as Maisie is concerned, there's nothing like a weekend vacation. And on weekend vacations, there's nothing like going fishing. And when one goes fishing, there's nothing like having fishing equipment. And when it comes to fishing equipment, Maisie has nothing. And no idea of what one uses to catch fish. So with her bus leaving in a half an hour for her vacation, our Maisie hurries down to the Potts department store to purchase the wherewithal to snare a few of our unsuspecting finny friends. Good afternoon, Miss. Can I help you? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, yes, sir. I, I would like something to catch fish with. Mm -hmm. Well, how about a rod? A rod? I want to catch fish, not shoot them. <laughs> oh, that's a good way, too. <laughs> did not it? Well, I, I also need a reel uh -huh. and one of those cork things that float uh -huh. and a hook. And how about a line? Certainly, and you must write to me, too. I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, miss, here's a nice rod that's all rigged up. Well, it's it's the right shade, but it doesn't seem very strong. Oh, but it is, miss. Just try casting with this rod. Well, I, I don't mind if I do. You're just a short, gentle cast. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're in a stall, remember. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here goes. One, two, three. <laughs> oh! I think I caught something. <laughs> and you broke the front window. Who in thunderation did that? Oh, you caught something, all right. Mr. Potts, the owner of the store. And is he sore? That's probably because I caught him out of season. <laughs> Who did that? Who cast that fishing rod and caught me right in the... Uh, miss, what have you got to say about this? I cannot tell a lie, Mr. Potts, but I'm sure going to try. <laughs> Look, Mr. Potts, yeah. I... I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Looks like I did already. <laughs> oh, so you did it, huh? There I was, calmly checking over the window display, and you hooked me right in the middle of my inventory. <laughs> and that's such a painful place, too, I know. And my beautiful window, a $50 window, smashed. Yeah, but I was just trying out this fishing rod. Young lady, what are you going to do about it? I think I'll take the fishing rod, wrap it up. Yes, miss, and will there be anything... No, no. I mean, who's going to pay for that broken window? Not me. What would I do with a broken window? <laughs> miss, you're going to pay for that window. Well, okay, as soon as I get back from my weekend vacation. You're going to pay for it right now, or else. Or else what? <laughs> 
I haven't heard a nasty laugh like that since I asked the hotel clerk for a room. <laughs> Miss, you're going to stay right here at the store and work out that $50. Yeah, but, but that'll take weeks, and my bus leaves in 20 minutes. Yes, but without you. Now get to work right at this counter, miss, and sell. But, but I'm not a good sales lady, Mr. Potts. The only sales job I ever had was in a used car lot, and I was fired from that because I always asked the customer to pay the ceiling price. Well, then you're lucky that... You're lucky that times are such that people are buying anything, especially in the sporting goods line. Oh, yes. Especially these $5 bow and arrow sets. They're guaranteed to hit the spot. Well, why would people want to pay Pop $5 to hit the spot when Pepsi-Cola does it for a nickel? I don't get that. Stop with the jokes, miss. Now, if a customer wants a demonstration, just pick up the bow and arrow. Okay, I'll try. Here goes. Well, no, miss, you're doing it wrong. Well, you're holding it backwards. Don't, don't release that arrow. <laughs> <laughs> My other show window, you smashed it. I now owe you $100, Mr. Potts. Shall we stop now, or do you want to try for 150 <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Come back here, miss. I'm going to make you a sales girl and pay off that $100, or die trying. You'll be sorry. Now, let's pretend that I'm the customer. Now, here I come into the store. Okay. And what can I do for you, sir? Uh, uh, I'd like to buy a mousetrap to catch a mouse. Yes, sir. A large mouse trap or a small mouse trap? Well, I, I don't really know. Well, how large is your mouse? Yeah, never mind. <laughs> Look, I, I want to buy a trap. I'm in a hurry. A hurry? Yes, I've got to catch a train. Oh, I don't think we have traps that large. <laughs> All right, forget it. Now, I'll come in again. Now, here I come. Good afternoon, clerk. I'd like to buy... I know, a mouse trap. No. I want a bathing cap. You want to catch the mouse or give him a shower? <laughs> Look, I want a bathing cap to swim in. Well, you'll be much more comfortable in a pool. Okay, okay. Now, you've just sold me a bathing cap. I did? <laughs> I'm pretty good, huh? Pretty good. <laughs> You're right. Now, remember, don't let the customer get away with just one purchase. Sell me everything in the store. Okay. You now have a bathing cap, sir. How about some water wings? They're $2. $2 mm -hmm. for water wings? Well, isn't that rather expensive? Yeah. You can get them across the street for a quarter. <laughs> now, we'll try it for the last time. Now, here I come. Good afternoon, clerk. Well, back again. No, no, no. You've never seen me before. Ah. Uh, I never forget a face. <laughs> Miss, I would like a bathing cap. See, I told you you were in here before. I want a bathing cap. Yes, sir. And how about some water wings? No, oh, I don't want any water wings. I'm beginning to hate you. The feeling is mutual. Now, look, we'll forget the bathing cap and the water wings and have you sell, uh, 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 say, golf clubs. Okay, golf clubs. I said it. Oh, don't be silly. <laughs> now, anybody can demonstrate and sell golf clubs. Anybody. You want to bet? <laughs> Not without odds. Look, I'll give you a set of clubs and a bag. Uh, here they are, right here. Okay. Which end of the bag do you hit the ball with? Take the mm -hmm. club. Mm -hmm. Now, make believe you're going to swing at that ball and then yell, four. Like this? Four. I said make believe. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Ramirez. I know. I shouldn't have said four because so far I've only broken three. <laughs> Southern is swell, isn't she, Frank? Sir, but the point I'm trying to make to this character is that we do pretty... Uh... Oh, Mr. Sifton, it's time for you to get ready to go on the air. Here's your script. Does he have to have a fresh script every time he does that same old tired station identification? You don't understand show business. Every station break is like an opening night. Please give me my cue. Millions are waiting to hear me. Good luck, Mr. System. Thank you. Quiet now, everybody. Mr. System is waiting for his cue. Looks like he's waiting to be kissed. I must ask for absolute silence. Your microphone's ready, Mr. System. Now? Not yet. How about you, Kwame? In a moment. 
You are listening to Stars in the Afternoon, the CBS preview of the best in radio. The biggest show in town will go into its third half hour after a brief pause for station identification. Now, Mr. System. Huh? Oh, oh yes, yeah, now. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> Boy, they really had the shows back there in 1946, didn't they? You really had to um, want to stick with them. The WBBM Air Theater in the lovely Wrigley Building, Chicago. <laughs> we have more of uh, stars in the afternoon promoting the uh, CBS fall lineup in just a moment. It would be nice. What I really should have done now, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say this, but what I should have done is to play this promo uh, now, this 90-minute show, and then go ahead and uh, play all of these shows every you know an example of all of these shows well maybe some other time we'll do that that's a good radio month feature type of a thing like that this is chuck shaden with our those were the days program wnib chicago at fm 97 Oop, pardon me here little buzz there that was the microphone was kind of coming out of the uh, the slot here that's funny how that was doing that wasn't it see I'm sending, I'm touching the mic, I'm sending signals. Tokyo Rose, can you hear me? <laughs> Someone must have bumped the microphone. Heads will roll. <laughs> we have more after Stars in the Afternoon. We have a Bergen and McCarthy program, a 10th anniversary for Edgar Bergen with uh, Don Amici, Dorothy Damour, Mortimer Snurd, Nelson Eddy, and Ray Noble in the orchestra. And then we're going to have Baby Snooks and Daddy talking about all the new shows on the CBS lineup something like three years before this Stars in the Afternoon program. You'll like that, too. Next week, we've got uh, Spotlight Review with Spike Jones. We have an Academy Award production of The Front Page. We have Durante and Moore. And we have Walter Winchell on the Jurgens Journal. And our special guest in a pre-recorded interview will be Pat O'Brien. We're going to salute Harlow Wilcox on the 15th of September with a half a dozen radio shows featuring Mr. Wilcox. And then the last two Saturdays in September, lots of old movies on radio. Listening to radio versions of Shadow of a Doubt, Magic Town, When My Baby Smiles at Me, The Lost Weekend, The Sea Wolf, Jezebel, The Jazz Singer, The House on 92nd Street, and lots more. So you'll want to stay with us on Saturdays throughout the whole month of September and even after that. Frank Sinatra, who you're hearing in our Stars in the Afternoon program this afternoon on Those Were the Days, is on the cover of our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide for September. He's a rather young Frank Sinatra from 1942. That's just the front page of our little publication. A one-year subscription, 10 issues, is just $7. You can subscribe right now if you call us at 545-2260. The September issue of our newsletter features articles about Kenny Delmar, who was Senator Claghorn on the Fred Allen Show, and about the Aldridge family, about Mrs. Davis from the Miss, our Miss Brooks radio show, an article about the College of Musical Knowledge and I Love a Mystery. Call 545-2260 to subscribe. A one-year subscription is $7. The number again, 545-2260. Our Nostalgia Newsletter gives you lots of information about movies and other special events at Northwest Federal, plus the complete listing of our Saturday afternoon Those Were the Days broadcast schedule here on WNIB. In it, you get complete information about all the shows we play every week, including original broadcast dates, names of stars and other cast members, network and sponsor identification, even the length of time of each segment that we present to help you record the old shows for your own collection. So subscribe now to our newsletter. We'll begin your subscription with the September issue, which you'll get by first-class mail at the beginning of the week, and we'll include an invoice along with your first issue. Call 545 22 Six zero. If the lines are busy when you call, won't you do us a favor? Wait just a moment, then dial back at five four five two two six zero. If you like, you can send seven dollars to Nostalgia Newsletter, Box four two one Morton Grove six zero zero five three. But as long as you're near a telephone and it's a good time to do so, why don't you dial us now five four five two two six zero. Our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide five four five two two six zero. Did you know that Magicus is the largest carpet, rug, and furniture cleaner in Chicagoland? That's why Magicus, the professionals in carpet, rug, and furniture cleaning, have the largest selection of unclaimed rugs for sale, $20 and up. 
Magicist rug sales rooms are conveniently located at 800 South Cicero Avenue, just one block south of the Eisenhower Expressway, and at 121st and Western in Blue Island. All unclaimed rugs from Magicist offer an excellent buy and make a great addition to your summer camper, RV, or that extra room in the house. And, of course, all unclaimed rugs have been Magicist cleaned. Magicist welcomes Visa and Master Charge, too. Visit the Magicist rug sales room at 800 South Cicero Avenue and 121st and Western, Monday through Friday, 8 until 6, Saturday till 4. And don't forget to bring your room measurements with you. Remember, Magicist cleans carpets, rugs, and furniture, too. For pickup and delivery service or for in-home or office cleaning, call 378-8600, 378-8600. Now, don't touch that dial. This is WNIB Chicago, FM 97. We're turning back the calendar to September 22nd of 1946 as we continue with Stars in the Afternoon. Mr. System, you know, I think you're taking your work much too seriously. Why don't you do it lightly, you know, tongue-in-cheek? Tongue-in-cheek? Gee, I wonder how that would sound. This is CBS. I wouldn't do. They wouldn't understand me. And you don't understand me. This big show just can't go on without some boy and girl songs. Oh, dear. Now, I'm not talking for myself. Peter Lynn Hayes, meet Mr. CB System. Hello. Hello. You mean this is the guy who's cooking up a storm for you two? Can you imagine? Well, let me have at him. Now, look here, Mr. System. Would you pass up the chance to have a man sing on your show who is as good as, as Bing Russell or Andy Crosby? <laughs> Even singing Sam, for that matter. Willie? Willie, he asks. Would I kid you? Listen, chum, here's how this Sinatra boy sounds. Have you a pianist? Would you give me a DiMaggio, Joe? Laura is the face in the moon. <laughs> Footsteps that you down the hall. Laura, I hate to disappoint all my Bobby Sock fans, but Laura is really the chick for me. <laughs> Laura was really from a wonderful family. She walked with dignity. As a matter of fact, she was a debutante. She came out last year. Of course, she still has to report twice a month to the parole board. <laughs> The most enchanting thing about Laura was her delightful accent. She was a southerner, and at a social gathering such as this, I'd often say, Laura, just for fun, tell the folks where you're from. And she'd say, I'm from New Orleans. Yuck, 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 yuck. <laughs> That's the way she used to talk all over her mouth. But whenever I'm lonely, which is often lately, I, I can always picture Laura silhouetted against the lovely southern moonlight as my boat pulled away from the levee. There she stood in her little gingham dress with crinoline pantaloons, and an Adam hat. <laughs> what a character. To coin a cliche, her eyes were like limpid pools. They sort of met at the bridge of her nose, and then they crossed. <laughs> her teeth were just like pearls. They looked like a picket fence in front of a haunted house. <laughs> Topping all of this in loveliness was her complexion. What a complexion. She must have used gunpowder. She was always shooting off her mouth. <laughs> that was Laura, but she's only a dream. She's only a That's what Frank Sinatra sounds like. Sure is. I knew I was white. Thanks a lot, Mr. S. And goodbye. <laughs> Very amusing, but now I'm in the mood for some romantic music. Hey, Dinah, did you hear that? We sold him. What would you like to hear, Mr. System? What would you like to hear? The American Melody Hour. American Melody. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is Howard Claney speaking for the American Melody Hour. Every Tuesday evening, the American Melody Hour brings you Bob Hannon and Evelyn McGregor singing the top songs of the day so you can know them all and sing them all yourselves. Today, Bob Hannon and the Knightsbridge Chorus, accompanied by Victor Arden, sing the beautiful love song to each his own. Gee, that was swell, Mr. System. Now, how's for Dinah me singing an intimate little ditty? Yeah. Will you please stop talking about singing? What is singing to me? Me, a man who twad the boards with Booth, Mansfield, John Wu, and the elder Bowiemore. So what? I twad the boards with the elder Dorsey. <laughs> I must ask you to stop bickering and either listen or weave. Listen to what? Mr. William Keeley of the Wux Radio Theater. Well, look, uh, what if I don't want to listen to Mr. Keeley? Mr. Keeley has Virginia Pools with him. Step aside, Donna. I'd love to listen to Mr. Keeley. <laughs> Lux presents Hollywood. Twelve years, going on 13, that theme has been your welcome to the world's most popular theater, the Lux Radio Theater, presided over every Monday night by one of Hollywood's most talented and genial personalities. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer of the Lux Radio Theater, William Keeley. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome briefly to the Lux Radio Theater. Tonight we bring you one of Screenland's loveliest stars, Miss Virginia Bruce, 
appearing in an excerpt from Somerset Maugham's great play, The Letter. Perhaps you remember the final scene. Leslie Crosby has admitted killing Jeff Hammond, but her trial is over and she's been acquitted, largely because a certain letter which she had written to Hammond never appeared in court. Now that she's free, her husband demands an explanation from Leslie and her lawyer of what the letter contains. I have the letter, Robert. But I have no right to show it to you. That letter cost me every penny I had in the world. And you tell me I can't even see it. Let him see it, Howard. Very well. Thank you. Leslie. Leslie, what does this mean? It means that I was in love with Jeff Hammond. No. I... I can't believe it. I'd been in love with him for years. Ever since he came to Malaya. Why did you kill him? Because he changed. Because I couldn't believe that he didn't care for me anymore. I hated myself for loving him, and yet he was everything in the world to me. He was all my life. I trusted you. I loved you. And then I heard about the native woman he had married. He had left me for her, and I couldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. At last I saw her. I saw her with my own eyes, walking in the village with the bracelets and the jewels he'd given her. I wrote to Jeff and told him that I had to see him. You hold that letter in your hand. I was mad to write it. But I didn't care. I hadn't seen him for ten days. Hammond was rotten through and through. He always was. We'd always been so careful. He always tore up any word I wrote to him. How was I to know he'd leave that one? That doesn't matter now. He came and I told him I knew about the other woman. He admitted it was true. He said he was glad I knew that now at last I'd leave him alone. He said things to me that I thought it impossible a man could ever say to a woman. Cruel and vile. And then I don't know what happened. I seized the revolver and fired. He staggered and rushed for the veranda. I ran after him and fired again. He fell and then I stood over him and I fired and fired and fired till there were no more cartridges. Have I deserved this of you, Leslie? No, no. I have no excuses to offer. I betrayed you. What shall I do now? What shall I do? Oh, if I could only blame anybody but myself. But I can't. I deserve everything I have to... Robert, where... Where are you going? I don't know. There's no need for me to make an exhibition of myself here. I'm sorry. He's going to forgive you, Leslie. He can't do without you. It's a pity you don't love him. But I still can make him happy. I swear I'll do everything in the world to make him happy. It's not easy to live with a man you don't love. You've had the strength and courage to do evil, Leslie. Maybe you'll have the strength and courage to do good. That will be your retribution. No. That won't be my retribution. I can do that and do it gladly. He's so kind, he's so tender. My retribution is greater. With all my heart, I still love the man I killed. Thanks to Virginia Bruce for bringing us so vivid an impression of the letter. It was a pleasure to be with you, Bill. From your first few shows, it looks as if you were off on another great season in the Lux Radio Theater. Thank you, Virginia, and thanks for being here today. This is William Keeley inviting all of you to be with us every Monday night when Lux presents Hollywood, its greatest plays, its greatest stars. We hope you'll join us. That radio theater is consistently sensational, Mr. System. 
And as if you didn't hear this before, where would you, where would, where would they get without romance, a boy and a girl? Or even just a boy. If you don't let Frank Sinatra sing on your program, your attitude is plain, downright ignorant. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, now sir. listen. Sometimes it pays to be ignorant. Which, oh. which is a very clever cue for the next program. Unintentional. If I have to say so myself, and I have to. And uh, we'll take that cue and uh, listen to uh, Pays to Be Ignorant and the last segment of Stars in the Afternoon in just a moment or so here on WNIB in Chicago at FM 97. I'm Chuck Shaden. This is our Those Were the Days program, and we have lots of good, in, uh, good entertainment coming up, uh, so stick around. Sony offers just about the best color TV you can buy these days. Sony Trinitron Television is about as close as you can come to trouble-free TV viewing. That sharp, crisp Sony picture is the best TV around, and though your Sony will probably cost more than most conventional TV sets, when you figure it out, Sony is really your best TV buy. Sony Television at Townhouse TV and Appliances, 7243 Tui Avenue, just west of Harlem. Open Monday, Thursday, and Friday nights till 9, Saturday until 5. Earlier this afternoon, we were talking about um, kind of a if there would be a club or something uh, where people could get together and talk about old-time radio and, and that sort of thing. And then we mentioned that there's a, a group of ham radio operators who uh, tune in uh, to each other on Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock and talk about uh, the radio things and set up trades and things of that nature. But I, I, it occurred to me that I should mention to you that uh, there, this is not a club situation, but if you would like to take a course in old-time radio, there's going to be a five-week specialty course uh, being conducted at Elmhurst College in Elmhurst, Illinois, on the five Tuesdays in October. And uh, you can reminisce, according to the, uh, to, the, to the program notes here, to the, not the program notes, but the catalog that lists this, says you can reminisce with the foremost collector of vintage radio and TV shows in a nostalgic look at those early days of yesteryear when out of the past came Fibber and Molly, Jack Armstrong, Amos and Andy, Ma Perkins, Lights Out, and your favorite programs. It's going to be held the five Tuesdays in October from the 2nd to the 30th from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m., and I'm going to teach the course. <laughs> so we're going to do a little thing like that. I'm quoting with them, as they say, I'm a foremost collector. I'm a collector, and I'm happy to share my things. And we're going to be talking about the, the origins of radio programming. We're going to talk about the transition of radio shows to television shows. I've got some interesting films and things like that to show, and we're going to uh, listen to some interesting film clips uh, or, or sound clips. Not real long. We won't listen to a whole show, but uh, we're going to be doing all kinds of things like that. So if you would like to have a, a kind of a formal informal look at the radio history of radio programming uh, maybe you would like to enroll in this course it costs 35 dollars for the five tuesdays for the five week course it's two hours a week for five weeks uh the five tuesdays in october at elmhurst college so any any folks out in that neck of the woods uh it's at the elmhurst center for special programs i can give you a phone number that you can call to get information or to register uh, for the course, and the phone number, and you'll have to call on Tuesday. I don't think you can call on a Saturday, uh, and Monday's the holiday. 279-4100, 279-4100, extension 476. I'll tell you more about this as we get a little closer to that, but uh, in case you're planning some uh, evening um, activities and you might like to get in on this little uh, gem, I'd be happy to have you there uh, in the course. Uh, I'm not a tough teacher. I'm not a hard grader or anything like that. You know, I wouldn't, uh, I grade on a curve. And uh, if you've got one, ladies, you're welcome to join. No, no, no. <laughs> it's no credit. It's a non-credit course. And it's just, a, it's a adult education and it's a fun. And I think you might have a, a good time with it. I know I'm going to have a good time with it. It'll be a variation on the course that I taught at Columbia College a few years ago. with, um, And everyone will... Uh, have the have access to cassettes of the old shows, and the, some of the homework will be to listen to a radio show in between. Uh, how tough can that be, huh? Of course, your prerequisite is that you have to listen to our uh, Saturday afternoon program, so maybe you qualify. It's going to be at Elmhurst College five Tuesdays in October, 
and you can register by or get information on it by calling Elmhurst College at 279 4100 extension 476 and if you want some more info on that give us a buzz here at uh, at our studio now it's time for us to continue with the last portion of stars in the afternoon <laughs> Alimony. Alimony is when two people make a mistake and the other continues to pay for it. Correct. <laughs> pay that man eight dollars. <laughs> What does a bee get in flowers? It's head and shoulders. Correct. Pay the man $9 <laughs> because... It pays to be ignorant. This is Ken Roberts. Johnny presents that quick, happy quiz program you hear regularly over CBS on Friday night. The program that has sent education back 2,000 years. It pays to be ignorant. Our board of experts consists of George Shelton, Harry McNorton, Lulu McConnell, who are so dumb they think astronomy is something you put in a sandwich. And now I'll give you the star of our show, Mr. Tom Howard. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The first question before our board of ex-jerks, I should mean experts, concerns radio. Here is the question. Yes. What major network is recognized by the letter CBS? Mr. Howard, would you mind repeating the question? I'd be glad to. <laughs> what major radio network is recognized by the letter CBS? Mr. Howard, what does the letter stand for? That's what I'm trying to find out. Well, why don't you call up the radio station that used those letters and ask them? Oh, I see. Mr. Shelton, you took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah. Uh, if you've been a little quicker, you've taken my teeth, too. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Shelton, do you know anything about radio? What do you mean? I was on the radio last night. I was on the program with a beautiful blonde, but I got Mike fright. You got Mike fright? Mike was her husband. Oh, oh. <laughs> yes. You know, Mr. Howard, I was on the radio. Yeah. Uh-huh. The show was at an army camp. I sang, darling, I am growing older. Fine. Mm -hmm. And you know, after the first few bars of the song, they tried to stop me. Try to stop you from singing? No, try to stop me from growing older. I see. <laughs> Speaking about songs, I wrote a new song yesterday. Yeah, what's the name of it? Don't put pretzels in the refrigerator. That's don't put bananas in the refrigerator. I know. <laughs> I gave it a new twist. All right. <laughs> Can we please get back to the question? It's about radio. I like to get in television. Oh, television may be all right, but it'll never replace the old-fashioned keyhole. <laughs> Do you think I look good in television? <laughs> what part of you? <laughs> all of me. They don't make television sets big enough to show all of you, Miss McConnell. <laughs> Is that so? Well, I've been told that my legs match Betty Grable's. Don't be silly. They don't even match each other. <laughs> oh, my word. Well, what's Betty Grable got that I haven't got? Not nothing at all. Only you've had yours too long. <laughs> well, you can say what you want about television. It'll be a great thing, you know. Just think. You'll be able to see Jimmy Durante in your living room, Fanny Bryce in your dining room, Tom Howard in your... It'll be a great thing. <laughs> Marvelous. Mr. McLaughlin, what makes you so dumb? <laughs> I have friends in Washington. I see. <laughs> The question is, what ma major radio network is known by the letter CBS? I don't believe any of you know anything at all about what radio. What are you talking about? I told you I did. I make a living on the air. You make a living on the air? Yeah. What station? Regan service station down at Seabright. I see. I check tires. I see. That's fine. My old man and I are going on the radio. One of those husband and wife programs. Oh, really? Really? Have you got a sponsor? Yeah. Bixley's Corn Plaster. Fine. That'll be fine. You're always corny, and your old man's always plastered. <laughs> hey, Mr. McDorton, do you yes. think radio is here to stay? Well, Mr. Shelton, ours isn't. No? Goes back to Macy's tomorrow. Oh, All right. Please, let's get away from the silly fox. Yes. Are you going to answer the question, or must you admit that you've met your Waterloo? Waterloo? What's that? Waterloo? That's one of those birds that looks something like a parrot. No, no, no. That's cockatoo. Oh, no. A cockatoo is a small horse that cowboys ride. That's, that's buckaroo. No, no, you're wrong, Mr. Howard. A buckaroo is not a horse. It's an animal that comes from Australia. Uh -huh. Sometimes they buck. Yeah. Wait a minute, that's kangaroo, a funny-shaped creature with a long nose, short arms, big feet, and a pouch in the front. Now we're back to Miss McConnell again. Uh -huh. <laughs> Gee, that 
that was great entertainment, Mr. System. A laugh's a laugh, but we still feel there's not enough romantic singing on the radio. We sing. You know, your voice sounds very interesting. You might make a good announcer. Who wants to be an announcer? Stop arguing. Here's a little two-wine announcement. Weed this and put what's a oomph into it. Okay, here goes. Look, no hands. Gee. Every Monday night, CBS brings you the Bob Hawk Show, featuring that fast equipped master, Bob Hawk. This afternoon, the biggest show in town brings you Bob Hawk in a more serious vein. Thank you, Frank Sinatra, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to light up the letters CBS and tell you what they really stand for. C stands for Columbia, and Columbia is people. People from every state in America. Main Street, Broadway, Hollywood and Vine, Brown and Elm. Yes, people from many of the nations around the great globe itself. The conductor of the famous Hour of Charm Orchestra, Phil Spitalny, was born in Russia. So was Al Goodman, maestro of the family hour. Artur Rodzinski, musical director of the New York Philharmonic, grew to love music in Poland and Vienna. Gene Hersholt, Columbia's Dr. Christian, came from Denmark. And Tom Howard claims County Tyrone, Ireland as his birthplace. I could name many more stars, writers, producers, and technicians at Columbia who brought gifts to America from lands across the borders and seas. As for those who were born in this country, well, just name your own town or city, and chances are some member of the Columbia family walked its streets or stood up to recite in its classrooms. Frank Sinatra used to be a sports reporter in Jersey City. Dinah Shaw once sipped chocolate sodas in a Winchester, Tennessee drugstore. Jimmy Durante shined shoes on New York's Lower East Side. Vaughn Monroe worked in a rubber plant in Jeanette, Pennsylvania. Gene Autry is no Hollywood cowboy. He actually punched cows in Tioga, Texas. And Robert McGregor Hawk, alias the fellow who's talking to you now, was born in Creston, Iowa, brought up in Weatherford, Oklahoma, and carried mail, jerk sodas, and tried to sell vacuum cleaners in Chicago. Yes, C stands for Columbia, and Columbia is people who work at the business of broadcasting just as you work in a steel mill, factory, office, on a farm, or at home. And that's what the letter B in CBS is for, broadcasting. The broadcasting not only of incomparable entertainment, but also of news, religious services, and programs that help you to understand the vital issues of an ever-changing world. For broadcasting in America is free. And free broadcasting means that you and I can hear what our different backgrounds and tastes say we want to hear. Not that there isn't room for improvement. There always is. Radio can be made richer. It can meet the growing needs of a people young and upward-reaching. And this season, and next, and the season beyond that, you can be sure that the people who make Columbia will be working to make broadcasting better under the system that represents the letter S in CBS, the American system. Thank you, and good afternoon. Sir, I guess that just about winds up your little program, Mr. System, and don't think it's been a pleasure meeting you. Me too, Mr. System, and I hope someday if we see each other again, I see you first. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wait, wait a minute, friends. You're not angry. Oh, no, we feel great. Oh, yuck, yuck. For an hour and a half, we've been trying to get you to let us sing, that's all. And you want to know something? I still think you need a romantic, huh? romantic duet. You want to know something? You've almost convinced me you're right. Almost? Uh-huh. Well, what do we have to do to really convince you? Yes, what would convince you that you do need a romantic duet? Well, I'd have to hear you first. Now you're getting somewhere. How about tea for two? Maybe wait a sing first. Oh, this is it, Frank. <laughs> Let's not fool around any longer. I'm discontented with homes that are rented So I have invented my own Is a lover's oasis where life's weary chase is unknown. Far from the cry of the city where flowers pretty caress the steam. Cozy to hide in, to live side by side in. Don't let it abide in my dreams. Picture you, a 
upon my knee Just tea for two And two for tea Just me for you And you for me On weekend vacations We won't have it known, dear That we own a telephone Day will break And you'll awake And start to bake A sugar cake Frank Sinatra and Dinah Shore, Jimmy Durante and Gary Moore, Ralph Morgan for the Screen Guild Players, The Family Hour, The Thin Man with Claudia Morgan and Les Damon, Bob Hawk, Blondie, Hoagie Carmichael, Vaughn Monroe and his music, House Jameson as the Crime Doctor, The American Melody Hour, Stat Cotsworth as Casey, Crime Photographer, It Pays to Be Ignorant, Sam Spade featuring Howard Duff, Gene Hirschholt as Dr. Christian, Ann Southern as Maisie, Peter Lynn Hayes, and William Keeley presenting Virginia Bruce for the Lux Radio Theater. Next Sunday, you're invited to tune in your favorite CBS station for another 90-minute preview of Columbia nighttime shows for the season of 1946 and 47. With Ozzie and Harriet, Big Town, Ginny Sims, Jack Carson, Meredith Wilson, Joan Davis, Dick Hames, Gordon Jenkins, Baby Snooks and Daddy, Gene Autry, Hollywood Star Time, Academy Award, Mel Blanc, Fox Pop, Eddie Bracken, Robert Trout and Ned Calmer, Hildegard, Bill Baker, Arthur Rudzinski, and Mayor of the Town. Afternoon was produced and directed by William N. Robeson and Robert Louis Sheon. The script was written and edited under the supervision of Carol Carroll, and the orchestra was conducted by Lud Gluskin. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> Well, it was a pretty good show there, wasn't it? Stars in the Afternoon from September 22nd of 1946. And holy smoke, they had a whole nother one next Saturday, next Sunday afternoon. That one we don't have in our collection. I sure wish we did. That would be a super follow-up on that. And that was the material that was being offered to listeners from a single network. A single network. How about that? Those were the days, right? This is Chuck Shaden, WNIB Chicago, FM 97. Charlie McCarthy's 10th anniversary show coming up, plus uh, Baby Snooks and Daddy, and uh, lots of fun, a lot of stars, too. Well, I have a sound for you now from the most famous radio broadcast of all time. It's from our cassette tape special for September, The War of the Worlds. Streets are all jammed. 
noise in crowds like New Year's Eve in city. Wait a minute, the... The enemy is now in sight above the Palisades. Five... Five great machines. First one is crossing the river. I can see it from here, wading... Wading the Hudson like a man wading through a brook. A bulletin is handed me. Martian cylinders are falling all over the country. One outside of Buffalo, one in Chicago, St. Louis. Seem to be time and space. Now the first machine reaches the shore. He stands watching, looking over the city. That's a scene from the Mercury Theater on the Air production of The War of the Worlds. It's a cassette tape special this month, and it's yours for only $5 from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. This is the original broadcast, a program that frightened half the nation on October 30th of 1938, an Orson Welles Halloween joke that ended up on the front pages of newspapers from coast to coast. It's an absolute must for your tape collection. And we have it this month for only $5 from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Or you can get the War of the Worlds at any office of Northwest Federal or when you visit our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Now, don't forget about our regular cassette tape for September, an all-star Armed Forces Radio Command performance from 1945. It's Dick Tracy and B-flat with Bing Crosby, Dinah Shore, Harry Von Zell, Jerry Colonna, Bob Hope, Frank Morgan, Jimmy Durante, Judy Garland, the Andrews Sisters, Cass Daly, and Frank Sinatra. It's a fun-filled hour of the biggest stars in Armed Forces Radio's biggest show, Dick Tracy in B-flat. Our cassette tape for September, just $5 from the Hall Closet, or at Northwest Federal, or at the MGM shop. Now, if you'd like both tapes, Dick Tracy plus The War of the Worlds, then send $10 to the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where Eden's Expressways, Cookie Boulevard, and Lake Avenue meet at Wilmette. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where you'll find quality merchandise for the entire family. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, easy to reach, easy to park, easy to shop. Back to school values all this week at Eden's Plaza Shopping Center in Wilmette. I'm Chuck Shaden. Those were the days WNIB Chicago at FM 97. Well, there's some sadness in our hall closet this week as we learn of the deaths of uh, a number of um, uh, people who uh, are in the world of entertainment. Stan Kenton, famous band leader, died last Saturday evening at the age of 67, a major figure in jazz and popular music for close to 50 years. During the 1940s, he became uh, one of the prime forces in the development of progressive jazz, and he was uh, active right to the end. Stan Kenton died at the age of 67 last Saturday evening. And uh, we learned this week of the death of Ray Eberly, big band singer of the 1930s and the 40s, who was the vocalist with the Glenn Miller Orchestra, singing such hits as Serenade in Blue, At Last, Elmer's Tune, and Moonlight Cocktail. Ray Eberly was 60 years of age. He died of a heart attack in Douglasville, Georgia. His brother Bob is, uh, was a singer with Jimmy Dorsey's band, and his brother Bob is still uh, working very regularly, uh, doing a lot of things with uh, uh, Tex Beneke in the orchestra and Helen O'Connell and uh, things like that. But Ray Eberly passed away last Saturday also, the 25th of August, at the age of 60, of a heart attack. And uh, early Friday... Sally Rand died. Sally Rand, who fan-danced her way to fame and fortune at the Century of Progress, the uh, Chicago World's Fair of 1933 and 1934. She had had a heart attack uh, a couple of days before and, uh, and then passed away uh, early, uh, early Friday morning. And she was 75 years of age. We had a, a chance to meet Sally Rand last year, last November the 11th, I believe it was, when she came to town for our salute to the Century of Progress at Northwest Federal Savings. We spent some time with Miss Rand, and she was a delightful person. And she came, uh, she's just a tiny little thing, uh, 105 pounds or something like that, 
and those fans were pretty heavy, and she came into the town. We met her at the airport. My wife and I met Sally Rand at O'Hare Field. She was supposed to come in at about 6.30 Friday evening, and she was going to be here for performances Saturday and Sunday. Well, if you've ever gone to O'Hare Friday evening at 6.30, it's the most incredible traffic jam in your life. Anyway, my wife and I met Sally at the uh, the ramp as she came in from the plane, and then they went to collect the luggage, and then I went to get the car to come around. Well, that was a, a horrendous mistake that took forever. And uh, I figured, well, she's just here for the weekend. She'll have one or two suitcases at the most. So I'm driving, inching by inching my way up to uh, United, I guess, is where she, she was. My wife was, I saw my wife standing over there, and Sally ran, is coming, she, she leaves the ramp, or the where, they, where the luggage was, and she starts coming towards the car when she... The car was pointed out to her. She says, come for the luggage. And I said, what luggage? I just, I'm waving to my wife, bring the suitcase, bring it over to the trunk. And the cars were all around. And my wife is frantically giving me the sign. She's, I don't know what she's saying. It, like there was no luggage or how could she get a... Finally, I inched my way over there and I went and Sally Ramos had eight pieces of luggage there. Incredible, great, big... You would have thought she was going to be here for a month and a half at least, you know. And uh, holy smoke, well, we, we couldn't get it all into the trunk of the car. We put them in the back seat, and uh, it was just all over. And then we went out to dinner. Uh, we were meeting some other folks, and the, 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 my wife and Sally Rand and myself and some other folks went, we went met for dinner. And then the, the luggage was all schlepped over to, <laughs> to uh, the, I guess she was staying at the Marriott. And it was very, very exciting because when we came up to the Marriott, uh, the doorman, who apparently a lot of the stars stay at the Marriott out there on the, on the Kennedy Expressway and um, Higgins, and uh, he recognized her, the doorman. He recognized her, and he says, that's Sally Rance. That's and then the whole business, everybody, the lobby was a flutter and a flurry, and this is really interesting because, you know, who would recognize Sally Rand. She's not Bob Hope, who stays at the Marriott unfrequently, I guess. But we had a delightful time with her, and uh, she enchanted the audiences who came to Northwest Federal on those two programs. And I think she must have signed an autograph for everybody. And she had her photo taken with so many people, and she provided us with a delightful program. And after the, uh, the second show on Sunday, Ellen, my wife and I, and Sally Rand went out to dinner. Uh, just kind of a quiet, uh, wind-down type type of a thing. And she was talking about her son who was adopted, and he's, um, he's about uh, 34 years old or so, and her grandchildren in her home in Glendora, California. And she had invited us to come out. She said it was loaded with all kinds of uh, souvenirs and memorabilia. And um, though we were in California earlier this year, we did not get a chance to go over there. And uh, now, of course... Yeah, you regret not having to do that. But I don't regret having the, had the opportunity to meet Sally Rand. She was quite a person. Uh, she was a feisty babe who uh, said what she wanted to say, and people would ask her, um, uh, did you ever wear anything while you were dancing with the fans? And her stock answer was, uh, the Rand is uh, quicker than the eye, you know. <laughs> and she was, uh, she was okay. And she said that... Uh, uh, you know, well, why do you, we ask why, and everybody always asked her, why do you still do this? You know, you're in your 70s, and she was 74 years old last year. She said, well, it beats sitting on the front porch rocking and doing needlepoint, you know. I mean, how many people will uh, can still get up there and dance with those fans and, uh, and make a whole business? And she was traveling all over the country. And she, she said that uh, her goal was to, uh, to be at the... Uh, um, at the 50th anniversary reunion for the World's Fair in 1983. She figured there would be one in 83 and there she would be at it, you know. Well, she didn't make it, but she's a was a very nice person, and uh, we feel a sense of personal loss. When you meet someone and spend some time with them like that, and I think that uh, anybody who went to Northwest uh, Federal for the, the, uh, the Century of Progress program last year uh, has a very special... Uh, a little bit of sadness uh, this weekend as they learned of the death of Sally Ram because she became um, a very warm person to everybody who came there. 
shaking hands with any of them, anyone who wanted to talk with her, have her picture taken. She was a nice, uh, nice person. And the Chicago Tribune uh, did a very nice article on her appearance there. And in fact, this morning on the back page of the Trib, the picture page that they did on Sally Rand, in the lower right-hand corner is a large picture, is a photo that was taken of her when she was at the Northwest Federal. And if you've ever been to our memory movies or any of the other events, you'd recognize the stairwell there. And she was there, and they mentioned it was at the Northwest Community Center. So Sally Rand passed away at the age of 75. She leaves behind her her many fans. Now let's continue with our Those Were the Days program as we go back to 1949 for a 10th anniversary broadcast, January 19th of 1949. This is an Armed Forces Radio rebroadcast of the Charlie McCarthy Show. Ladies and gentlemen, greeting you on behalf of Edgar Bergen, Colin McCarthy, Ray Noble, and his orchestra, Mortimer Snurd, and Pat Patrick. Today marks Edgar Bergen's 10th anniversary on the air, and on this special occasion, many of his old friends have promised to drop in. It was just about 10 years ago that Edgar and Charlie were making the rounds of the different agencies, hoping to get an interview. And finally, the big day came. They were sitting in Rudy Valley's office. <laughs> Bergen, we've been waiting here for Rudy Valley for three days. I'm getting hungry. Hungry? Yeah. Well, I'm the one that's hungry. I tell you, Charlie, I'm so starved, I could almost... Uh... Don't look at me that way. <laughs> no, I'm just skin and bone, Bergen. I'd, I'd only stick in your teeth. Oh. <laughs> Are you sure this is Rudy Valley's office? Oh, it must be. There's a picture of Rudy Valley looking at a picture of Rudy Valley. <laughs> His Excellency, Rudy Valley. <laughs> Will everybody rise, please? Welcome, your furniture. <laughs> Good morning, G. Take my raccoon coat and bring me my diamond-studded megaphone. Uh, Mr. Valley, we came to talk to you about your radio program. Yes, yeah, awfully good, isn't it? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's not that so much, but what we really want is we were... Excuse me, very busy man. Yes. yes. Hello, it is I, Rudy Valley. <laughs> it is I. Grammatical blighter, Amy. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right, absolutely right. Yes, indeed. I'm the president and founder of the Rudy Valley Fan Club. Send all dues directly to me. <laughs> Goodbye. Let me see, what were we talking about? Well, Mr. Valley, I wanted to ask Oh, you... yes, you want my autograph, no doubt. Well, no, we don't, dear. Well, just what are you fellows doing here? Well, I'm a ventriloquist. A what? A ventriloquist. I talk through my stomach. That's nothing. I sing through my nose. <laughs> Acrobats, jugglers, now ventriloquists. I have everything thrown at me. Even grapefruit. <laughs> oh, this is a thankless job. I spend my days and nights looking for talent, high and low. Well, why don't you hire us? I hadn't intended to look that low. <laughs> well, we promised to work hard. Well, are you reliable? You boys don't drink, do you? No. Drink? We hardly eat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to take a chance on you anyway, against my better judgment. Oh, thank you, Mr. Valley, thank you. I deeply appreciate your generosity. Oh, stop licking his hand on <laughs> And now, Mr. Valley, uh, what about money? Oh, that's all right. You won't have to pay me anything. No. Well, now that the deal is said, if you'll just sit there and be quiet, I'll rehearse my big song number for the broadcast. For I'm just a vagabond lover in search of a sweethearted sea. <laughs> Thank you. 
Surely here was charm beyond compare to view. Maybe it was just that I was there with you. Was just a garden in the rain. But then the sun came out again. much confusion around here. And you, you seem all at Twitter, you know. Well, I ought to be, Ray. It's my 10th anniversary. Oh, yes. <laughs> how jolly. I wish I were only 10. Uh, <laughs> no, no, never mind, Ray. Just, just, just let it go. Let it go. Come in, come in, come in. Hello, Fram. Hello. Uh, <laughs> Fram, uh, I am a Western Union boy. Oh, you are? Yeah. Well, no, no, I'm not exactly a boy either. no. 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 But I am young for my age. Oh, yes, you yes. are. But you are from Western Union. Well, I'm, I'm not I'm not really a member of the Union, no. Oh, I see, you're not. <laughs> no. And I'm not exactly a Western you're either. Not a Western. No, Western. I'm just out here for the winter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's very interesting. But do you have a wire for me? Well, I'm not supposed to give it to you. I'm supposed to sing it to you. Oh, Yes, but I'm not in good voice today no. because I have an empty touch of Quincy. Yeah, I see. <laughs> well, then read it. All righty. Uh, it says, uh, yes. and I quote, Oh, sure. Uh, Greetings and Felissa, uh, take on. Mm -hmm. uh, may you always continue. Hi, Edgar. Well done to meet you. Uh, 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 greetings and uh, greetings, greetings and, and felicitations. Oh, wait a minute, that's my line. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just a moment, and now I'll continue with my wife. Yes. Uh, greetings and felic. Oh, for goodness sake, my God! Uh, what's the matter, friends? This is a night letter, yes. and I cannot read this until after dark. So goodbye, all. <laughs> Well, this is a surprise, Don. Yes, sir. I couldn't let an important event like this go by, Edgar. Well, well, well. Hiya, fellas. Hiya, Moochie. Hiya, Dolly. <laughs> <laughs> Look what I found. Dottie Lemour. <laughs> How are you, Don? Oh, Dorothy, I see you're more beautiful than ever. Yes, Dottie, you're as slim and as graceful as a fawn at daybreak. Yeah. What's your secret? Well, Don, I always watch my figure. Well, who doesn't? <laughs> oh, Charlie. Oh, Dottie. Oh, brother. I guess you lovebirds want to be alone, huh? Yeah, do you mind a moochie? We want a smoochie. Oh, come on, Edgar. I want to talk to you. Okay, Don. Oh, Dottie. What have you been doing since last date we had? Oh, nothing. Just giving my diary a chance to cool off. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, those were the days, weren't they, Donnie? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. You were so cute when you used to come and call on me. Um, we used to sit on my porch swing yeah. holding hands and eating peppermint. Yeah, well, don't tell everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wasn't it wonderful? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I could sure go for some of those peppermints. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you little rascal. Yeah. Remember that little song you used to sing to me, Dottie? Oh, you mean this one oh. when I goes, 
da 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 Get your gun. Ray Noble and his orchestra play Ray's special arrangement of I've Got the Sun in the Morning.
And that's the first half of the Charlie McCarthy Show from January 19th of 1949, an Armed Forces radio rebroadcast of this uh, show. A little uh, nostalgia from uh, Bergen and McCarthy right there. I'm Chuck Shaden. This is our Those With the Days program, WNIB Chicago, FM 97. <laughs> You'll find a generous helping of memories from and about the good old days at our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Come in and browse for a while. You'll find a complete selection of big band, personality, and soundtrack recordings, as well as hundreds of the great old-time radio shows on cassette, 8-track tape, and LP records. You'll find books and magazines about the golden age of radio, the early days of television, the fabulous movies, and the stars of yesteryear. There's an amazing selection of memorabilia, giant one-sheet movie posters, theater lobby cards, Riverview memories, movie stills, magazines, and lots more. Visit Metro Golden Memories, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Open seven days a week, Monday through Friday from 11 till 5, Saturday from 11 to 7.30, and Sunday from noon to 5. Come in and see all the goodies at the good old Metro Golden Memories shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, in Chicago. And you can stop by tonight if you like on the way over to see the movie at Northwest Federal because we were opening our memory club season for the new year with uh, a Laurel and Hardy double feature tonight. Blockheads from 1938 and Flying Deuces from 1939. Dues, uh, rather a donation is a dollar and a quarter payable at the door and uh, proceeds go to recognized charities. So doors open at 7.30. We'll be there tonight to uh, kick off the season with Stan and Ollie and with you too. So you can pop over and see a good movie and at the ahead of it stop over to the MGM shop. Shop will be closed by the way on uh, Monday Labor Day. Now let's continue with Bergen and McCarthy. Oh, popcorn, popcorn, and ice cream cones. Get them while they're hot. Oh. Hello, Mr. Burger. Marty McSnerd. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing selling ice cream cones and popcorn? Well, I, I hear there's, a, there's some kind of a celebration here for, for Annie. Annie. Yeah. You mean anniversary? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the girl. Yeah, yeah. Why, Mortimer, most of these bags of popcorn, they're only half full. Uh, yep, yeah, that's right, yeah. Why is that? I like popcorn. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> well, how much do you make on a bag when you sell it? Well, I buy them for 10 cents a bag, and then I come right around and sell them for a nickel. Indeed. What kind of business is that? Well, I think they call it some. Oh, they call it some. Overhead. Overhead. <laughs> what do you mean, overhead? Well, it's over yeah. my head. It was well, good. But <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hush up, I'll grab <laughs> A bunch of silly slickers here. Yeah. Better can't say nothing around here without them rowdy snickering at all. Now, be polite, Mortimer. That's our audience. Mm -hmm. They let anybody in, don't they? Yeah. Well, they let me in. Hello, Mortimer. Yeah. Remember who this is, Mortimer? Uh, the, um, oh, give me a hint. <laughs> oh, never mind. It's Dorothy Lamour. Can't you give me a better hint than that? <laughs> oh, no. Why, you must know her. Why, we're old friends. Well, yes, well, any friend of yours uh, is, uh, is a friend of... Any friend of yours is a... Let's see. Um, <laughs> what was the discussion? <laughs> oh! <laughs> Mortimer, yeah. after all the years we were together and you don't even remember my name, mm. that's a fine how do you do. How do you do? <laughs> well, I'm sure you know me. Look at me. Oh, gosh, no, I ain't old enough for that yet. <laughs> you, you're too pretty for your own good. Oh, looks don't count. Mm. Well, mine do. <laughs> 
Oh, you're so cute, Mortimer. Oh. You have such pretty blue eyes. <laughs> pretty blonde hair. Oh. The cutest little dimple. <laughs> I got a mole on my stomach, too. <laughs> you know, you're really irresistible. No, I'm really Mortimer. <laughs> I'm awfully fond of you. Yeah. Wouldn't you like to kiss me? Oh, gosh, thanks. No. What would you think of me afterwards? <laughs> you turned down the chance to kiss Dorothy Lamour. Mortimer, you must be the most stupid person in the world. Well, thanks. But this is your big day. Let's give you some of the credit. <laughs> oh, I mean, <laughs> I think that Mortimer is the funniest thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Uh, always that so, huh? Well, next to the funniest thing, anyway. Yeah, well, that's better. Thank you, Don. The funniest person was that character I used to play, Gazola. <laughs> I'm inclined to agree with you, Don. We had plenty of laughs for that character. All those in favor of having me do Gazola again, say, I, 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 demand a recount here later. Not so fast for that. Go ahead, Don. What business is Gazola in this time? Well, let's make him Leonardo... Amici Gazzola, Doctor of Dentistry, one flight up. One flight up. Right. Uh, oh, Bergen, this tooth is killing me. Well, that's all right, Charlie. The dentist will see you now in just a moment. Yeah. yeah. You won't have to suffer much longer. Well, I, I don't mind the suffering so much. It, it, it's the pain I can't stand. I know. <laughs> Hello, 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 and how do you do? Well, hello, Dr. Hoyt. I'm Edgar Bergen. You were highly recommended to me, Dr. Hoyt. Well, that's just fine. Yeah. That's yeah. just fine. But uh, Dr. Hoyt, he just stepped out of heavy seat to fix. Oh, he did, I see. Yeah. <laughs> well, who are you? I'm his substitute. Substitute. <laughs> Filling in for a friend, huh? Yeah. I'm Amici Gazzola, poster class of dentist, DDS, RFD, and SOS. Yeah. Pull the teeth while you wait. Yeah. <laughs> Gazzola, if you're a dentist, I'm Dorothy Lamour. Please to meet you, Mr. Lamour. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think Charlie has a cavity, Doctor. Oh, now, yeah? please, do you do fillings and inlays? Oh, sure, sure. We got inlays, outlays, decays, doorways. Yeah. <laughs> Dondes, Mondes. Always! Oh, all right, all right. This is awful. This is all right. All right, come on, kid. Jump in the side of the chair here. Now, now, now just a moment. I don't know. Oh, what's the matter? What's the matter? You know, act very smart. If we were smart, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> come on, kid. To climb up one of my chairs, Tony boy. Oh, no, no. You're not going to sing me into that, though. Now, tell me about your prices, Doctor. Can you give me rock bottom price? I'm a just the fellow. I got it at the rockiest at the bottom end of the city. Well, that's... <laughs> What I mean is, what are your rates? Oh, rates? Yes. Rates, do you say? Well, yes. I got to cut the rates, V8, sofa plates, and a blue plate. Yeah. <laughs> With the two kinds of funky pie. <laughs> now, what is this? All right, so come on, kid. Open it, a chair, bambino. Okay, baboono. <laughs> All right, open it wide to the mouth now. Uh, uh, Holy mackerel. Quite a wind tunnel, ain't it? <laughs> oh, say, that's a bad. That's a very bad. Yeah. Let me see. Where is my pliers? Yeah. Oh, no, no, you don't. Let me out of here. What's the matter? Yeah, I'll come back. I'll come back when you're not here. I... Look, kid, oh. later, later is no good. Oh. This is too the mind to get to so bad that we got to end the tip of your head. Yeah. <laughs> now, which is too she's hurt? Well, I'm not sure which one it is. I think it's my cuspidor. You cuspidor? Yeah. The one I spit through. <laughs> <laughs> Look, kid, the from experience, so let's play him safe. Yeah. Let's to pull them all out, huh? Yeah. No, no. Hand me down no. my novo okay. No. Hand me down hey. my novo okay. Wait a minute. I do. What's the matter? You 
Oh, you China chiseler, you take it easy. You're not going to pull any of them. Okay, okay. Let's not to pull them. Let's to fill them up, huh? Yeah. So What's oh. the kind of filling you like? It doesn't matter. Lemon or coconut custard. Oh, <laughs> Kid, how about some nice pongy pie, huh? Now, don't start that again. No, all right. So we'll start. <laughs> Doctor. Yes. It should either be gold or silver filling. Oh. That's quite obvious, I think. Now, what do you want? What do you want in your teeth, Charlie? I don't care, just as long as they have white sidewalls. All right. <laughs> now, for the last time, Doctor, how much is it going to cost me? Well, look, let's make a figure out here. All right. We've got to use a little multiplication here. Yeah, yeah. Uh -oh. Got a little subtraction, too. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's the, there's the X-ray. X-ray. Fill of the tooth. Fill of the tooth. That's a two for five and a three for ten. Yeah, one for all and all for one, yes. That's the right. This is a smart kid, ain't it? <laughs> That's the, we punch into the ten and pull out the tooth. Go on and the chain, we'll let's bring over this side of here. <laughs> then pull this one over here and bring it down. Yes. And it here. You carry one and I'll carry one. <laughs> okay. How does it come out, Doctor? What do you know? Is it come out two kinds of bongi pie? That's all, brother. That's all. That's all. <laughs> Don, that gazola and all my travels, there's never been a dentist like that. Well, you ought to know because you've been on the road to everywhere, Donnie. <laughs> oh, you think gazola's funny, huh? Wait till you hear my French character, Pierre Soubon. Ah, boom, yeah, well, no, no, not that, not that, not that. Nelson Eddy. <laughs> Hiya, gang. Hi, oh, Nelson. Oh, yeah. well, welcome, Nelson. Oh, it's swell to be here, Edgar. I always enjoy shaking hands with old faces. Yeah. <laughs> well, don't look at my face. Yeah. By the way, Nelson, you were excellent in that Disney picture, Make Mine Music. Oh, thank you, Edgar. Yeah. You know, Charlie, Nelson did all the voices and the singing for all the whales, too. Yeah? Did you share equal billing with a whale? <laughs> Uh, no, no. I was the main squirt. Yeah, I see. Ah, ah. Oh, blubber. Am oh. I hot tonight? <laughs> Say, what do you think, Charlie? I think you better sing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
Yes, indeed. It, it was superbly adequate. Uh... <laughs> Remember, Charlie, we heard Nelson sing the same song at his concert. It was two weeks ago, I believe. Oh, were you there? Yes. Yeah, yes, we certainly were. And, and, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say this. You, you don't mind uh, constructive criticism? Oh, no, no, not at all. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you this confidentially. Mm. Your, your your voice was good, Nelson. Thank you. Oh, it was good. I appreciate yes. that. Yes, but... Uh, now, you don't mind it. No, I don't mind. Go on ahead, Charlie. Your diction... Your diction voice... It was it that in the last number. I couldn't understand a word you said. Oh, Charlie, I, I sang that song in Italian. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> well, that explains it. Watch it next time. Uh, I'll say no more. I guess you're embarrassed enough as it is. <laughs> no, Charlie, Charlie, you don't get it. The song was written in Italian. Well, so what? You see a sign that says, This way to Pismo Beach? Doesn't mean you have to go there, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you see, this song, this song was written by Mozart. And he's one of the greatest composers that ever lived. Well, if he's so good, why don't you have him write it in English? <laughs> now, Charlie, Mozart is dead. Oh. But his works are immortal. Yeah. He'll live forever. If he's dead, he will live forever. <laughs> he's up, he's down. Why don't you guys get together? You know, uh, Mozart was responsible for the marriage of Figaro. Oh, so they finally got hitched, huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah but I don't give that one six months. <laughs> <laughs> Edgar, I don't like to spoil the fun, but it's close to goodbye time. Well, you're right, Rudy. By the way, we sincerely appreciate you giving us our first start in radio. Wouldn't you like to say something? Yeah, Rudy, say something. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. I apologize. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to thank you, Dorothy Lamour, Nelson Ading, and Don Amici for making this evening such a memorable one. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night and thanks to you, our radio audience, for listening to our show for the past ten years. the Charlie McCarthy Show, their 10th anniversary broadcast, and the date we have is January 19th of 1949. However, they did start in radio for Chase and Sanborn, 1936, I believe, so it's possible that uh, there could be a, an error in the dating on this thing, but uh, we'll uh, have to check into all of that. I'm Chuck Shaden. This is our Those Were the Days program, WNIB Chicago, FM 97. If you're not a subscriber to our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide, Now's a good time for you to subscribe. Find out all the good things coming up in the months ahead of us. Frank Sinatra from 1942 is on the cover of the September issue, and I think you'll find lots of good reading uh, from and about the past in our newsletter. A one-year subscription, 10 issues, is just $7. You can subscribe right now when you call us at 545-2260. We have articles this month about Senator Claghorn, the Aldridge family, our Miss Brooks, the College of Musical Knowledge, and I Love a Mystery. A one-year subscription, $7. Call 545-2260. We also give you all kinds of information about the programs that we broadcast. And if you're taping, why, you get a lot of good help uh, because we give you the times of each segment. And a lot of people say they, they Xerox the page or they cut it out and they take the information that we have in our listing and tape it on the cassette package or on their tape box. So you get a lot of good information about the shows. 545-2260, a one-year subscription, $7. If you like, you can send $7 to Nostalgia Newsletter, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. But why not uh, call right now this afternoon at 545-2260. It's Northwest Federal Savings Time. We've got more time for you. Northwest Federal has the time to help you plan sensibly for your financial future, whether you're just starting your career or already well on your way to retirement. If you're employed but not a participant in a retirement fund, Northwest Federal can help you set up an IRA plan. 
You will not have to pay income tax on the money you deposit into the plan until retirement. Earned interest on IRA funds is also tax deferred until retirement when you're likely to be in a lower tax bracket. If you're self-employed, you and your employees are eligible for tax-sheltered savings through the Keogh plan. A Northwest Federal Keogh account also saves you tax dollars on funds invested and interest earned. Stop by any Northwest Federal Savings Center for full details on either plan. Northwest Federal IRA and Keogh plans. It's just another example of how Northwest Federal does more for you. It's Northwest Federal Savings Time. We've got more time for you. And Northwest Federal Savings has an interesting program about Bing Crosby, his life and his music uh, being planned for Saturday evening, the 6th of October, and Sunday afternoon, the 7th, at the Northwest Federal Community Center Auditorium on Irving Park Road. It'll be a special tribute to Bing Crosby, presented by Joe Vance, who is a collector of Crosby phonograph records, books, and memorabilia. There'll be some 700 slides accompanied by appropriate music and commentary, and uh, we'll have uh, a full-length film from 1936, Pennies from Heaven, starring Bing Crosby with Madge Evans, Louis Armstrong, Edith Fellows, and Donald Meek. It's a fine program. It'll be repeated uh, twice, Saturday evening at 8 o'clock, Sunday afternoon at 2. Donation is $2 per person with uh, all proceeds going to recognized charities. I think you might enjoy it, especially if you've enjoyed the Bing Crosby material we've been playing throughout the summer on our Those Were the Days program. You can get tickets in advance, and I urge you to get tickets in advance because they are going rather well now. And uh, you can pick up those tickets at any office of Northwest Federal Savings uh, during regular business hours, or if you stop uh, at our memory movie on a Saturday night, like tonight if you're coming to see uh, the Laurel and Hardy double feature, you can pick up your tickets this evening for the Crosby um, tribute or any of the other Saturday, Sunday programs that we have at uh, Northwest Federal. I'm Chuck Shaden. This is WNIB in Chicago at FM 97. Now we're going back to 1943 at the beginning of the season, the broadcast season, where we have a, a stack of uh, three and a half to four minute uh, promotional announcements that played on the network for uh, the Columbia Broadcasting System and featuring Baby Snooks and Daddy. And here's the first one. Ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience, Daddy! unaccustomed as I... Quiet, Snooks. <clears throat> unaccustomed as I am to being a radio critic, I would like to tell you about a program which can be heard Monday through Friday on this station. It's called I Love a Mystery. Mm, I like that program, Daddy. All right, you like it. Don't bother me. Why? Because certain influential people I know are going to sponsor me in a series of broadcasts in which I intend to talk about radio shows that appeal to my discriminating taste. Understand? Yeah. You do? Uh-huh. Well, what did I say? I don't know. <laughs> I thought so. We'll skip it if you don't mind. Now go away. All right, Daddy. <clears throat> I Love a Mystery is a fast-moving, action-packed adventure story featuring that master detective, Jack Packard, of the A-1 Detective Agency, who, with his beautiful secretary, Mary K. Brown... Look! Look, is that you banging? Yeah, it's me, Daddy. Well, what are you doing? I'm trying to fix the clock. Well, stop it. I did. That's why I'm trying to fix it. <laughs> oh, good heavens. You weren't banging on the grandfather clock, were you? Well, were you? Wasn't I? <laughs> that clock is a hundred years old. Is that why it's called a grandfather's clock? No. It happens to be an antique and very valuable. Why? Because it's so old and broken. Well, now it's more broken. Now, don't be fresh. And if you annoy me anymore, I'll spank you. Now, that's a promise. What are you doing, Dad? I told you. I'm going to talk about Isle of a Mystery. A thrill-packed program which I enjoy every evening. <laughs> Tell me about it. You know about it. You listen to it every weekday. Tell me one of the stories. If I tell you, will you stop pestering me? Mm-hmm. All right. Well, this style of a mystery story is called Bride of the Werewolf. It's about a girl who marries a man, but the man is half wolf. Oh. <laughs> when he's a man, he pursues his normal routine. But do you know what he does when he's a wolf? Uh-huh. What? He pursues girls. <laughs> no. He loses all vestiges of civilization. And here's where Jack Packard, master criminologist, comes in. Where? Here. 
All Jack Packet needs is a small slice of luck and a big slab of intellectual ratiocination. That's his muscle. Huh? Have you been listening to me? Yes. Well, repeat what I said. There's a big slab at the radio station, and that's his mother. <laughs> oh, fine. Don't you ever use your brain? What brain? Touche. <laughs> now let's consider the subject closed. Oh, ain't you going to tell me one more about a love, a love mystery? Snooks, didn't you promise me you wouldn't bother me? Mm-hmm. Well? Well, I didn't keep my promise, so you don't have to keep yours. Oh, I can see I'll have to rehearse while you're here. Concerning I Love a Mystery, ladies and gentlemen, you'll find it a nerve-tingling adventure. Listen in every weekday evening on this station for the pulsating, vibrating intrigues of Jack Packard, Terry Burke, Mary Kay Brown, and the A1 Detective Agency. That's I Love a Mystery, every Monday through Friday over this station. Good night, Daddy. Okay, that's the first of these little CBS promos for the network in 1943. We'll be uh, joining Baby Snooks and Daddy in just a moment for another one of those little gems from, uh, from that year. They were either run on the network or they were sent to affiliated stations uh, for broadcast to hear them there within their broadcast schedule. Chuck Shaden, WNIB Chicago, FM 97. Paternal Foremost Liquors at 5303 Milwaukee Avenue at Central, just north of Foster. That's where fine wines have been a part of family tradition for three generations. Put a visit to Paterno on your agenda. You'll be amazed at the fabulous wine cellar. Paternal Foremost Liquors, Chicagoland's one-stop beverage mart for imported and domestic wines, beers, cordials, soft drinks, whatever. Visit the wonderful world of Paterno, Monday through Saturday from 9 in the morning till 10 at night, Sunday from noon to 6, and on uh, Monday, Labor Day, be open till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Paternal Foremost Liquors, 5303 Milwaukee Avenue at Central, just north of Foster. Let's rejoin now Baby Snooks and Daddy. Daddy. Get under the cover, Snooks. The doctor will be here any minute. Did you call Dr. Clifton? Oh, of course. He's the best family physician I know of. Why? Well, you've listened to his radio program, haven't you? Mm hmm Dr. Christian, the small-town physician, the famous country doctor, he has an absorbing, heartwarming story to tell every Wednesday evening. And why is it heartwarming? I don't know. Why? Because Dr. Christian is a gentle country practitioner whose medicine is the milk of human kindness. Mm hmm Oh, there he is now. I'll go down and open the door. Mm hmm Come right in, Dr. Christian. I, I was so sorry to hear Snooks is sick, Mr. Higgins. I, I was out, but my secretary, Judy Price, took the message. Oh, it's nothing serious, Doctor. Just a typical childhood complaint. I know what you mean, Mr. Higgins. With children, anything they shouldn't eat is a delicacy. Uh, it's a stomach, I take it. Yes, I think so. Now, well, here we are. Hello, Snooks. Hello, Dr. Christian. Uh, she won't tell me what's wrong, so I'll leave you alone with her. Yes, uh, leave her to me. Well, Snooks, I've uh, been starting to use your manner. Uh, let me see your tongue. There you are. Ah. <laughs> hmm. Yes, it uh, does have a coat on it. I keep it open. Are you looking for the pen? <laughs> <laughs> no, of course not, child. <laughs> what have you got in that little black bag? Uh, I'm afraid there's nothing in it that would interest you, Snooks. I want to see the baby. I have no baby today. It's just a little emergency kit. Well, I want to see him. See who? The little kid. Kid, not kid. Here, look at the bag if you want to. All right. What's this wood for, Dr. Christian? Those larger ones are splints for broken bones. Do huh? you have any idea how many bones there are inside you? I didn't swallow any bones. <laughs> no, 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 your own bones. Take your spine, for instance. That's the pony thing that runs down your back. Is it running? <laughs> no. Oh, can't you feel it? Right there? Uh, that's your spinal column. Your head sits on one end. Can I sit on the other? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> that's so fashion. <clears throat> but uh, I was explaining the human skeleton. Skeleton? Yes. Uh, you know what that is, don't you? Mm-hmm. It's a man with his outside off and his inside sticking out. 
Well, uh, uh, maybe we'd better get on with the diagnosis. My feet are cold. Well, didn't your father give you a hot water bottle? Yeah, but I couldn't get my foot in the neck. Uh, we'll take care of that later. <clears throat> now, tell me, child, what did you eat this afternoon? Nothing. You know, Snooks, if you tell the truth, uh, you'll get your reward in the end. Mm, that's where I always get it. <laughs> Listen, dear. I know you ate something that disagreed with you. Perhaps it was ice cream or candy. Now, if you tell me what it was, I'll cure you and you'll be able to eat some more. Dr. Christian, are you going to let me eat some more worms? Is that what you ate, worms? Mm-hmm. We was playing imitations, and I had to do an imitation of a chicken. Is that the only way you could imitate a chicken? Well, I couldn't lay an egg. <laughs> I see. I see. Well, don't worry, Snooks. We'll give you something to take care of that worm. Ain't you going to take care of me? I think a tablespoonful of this delicious medicine... Well, Doctor, is she all right? Oh, there's nothing to worry about, Mr. Higgins. I've got everything under control. That's what I like about you, Dr. Christian. And I bet that's why everybody listens to your swell program every Wednesday night. The human, heartwarming stories that you and your nurse, Judy Price, bring to our firesides every Wednesday a truly grand entertainment. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Higgins. Now, about this medicine, Snooks. Well, Snooks, say something. Open your mouth. Another little uh, promotional bit there by Baby Snooks and Daddy, this time for Dr. Christian. I think the next one coming up is uh, one that they'll be talking about, uh, oh, meet Corliss Archer, and we'll have that in just a second. I'm Chuck Shaden, WNIB Chicago, FM 97. I want to remind you about our custom cassette service. If you've ever heard anything on our broadcast uh, that you'd like to have as a copy for your, in a cassette copy for yourself, we'll be happy to make that copy for you. We have a service now where we can provide you with a copy of any broadcast that we've ever uh, presented on our Those Were the Days uh, program or our Hall Closet program, for that matter, when we were doing that in the mornings. The fee for this service is $6.50 per half-hour program, and uh, you can send that amount along with all the information that you can possibly give us about the show that you want. When we broadcast it, the date of the program, stars, titles, anything else like that, Send that to the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Now, if you didn't get it off the air when uh, we broadcast it, if you blew it when you were taping it, or if you just decided after the fact that, gee, maybe I should have had a copy of this show, well, we can help you out with that service now. Uh, if you need some information about it, give us a call here at 545-2260. Okay, we're ready now with the next uh, little CBS promo with Baby Snooks and Daddy. Ladies and gentlemen, today I intend to discuss the outstanding radio program, Meet Corliss Archer. Daddy! Oh, that voice. It haunts me. <clears throat> Corliss Archer is a young lady who will quickly win your heart. She's... She's... Snooks! Snooks, where are you? I thought I told you to take care of Robespierre. Why is he crying? He fell down the stairs. Fell down the stairs? Daddy, he was coming down anyway. Now, how can Robespierre come downstairs? He, tried... he can't even walk. Well, he tried to slide down the banister. What banister? You know there's no banister on our stairway. Robespierre knows it now, too. <laughs> no, if one hair of your little brother's head is... Oh, he didn't hurt himself. Then why is he crying? He wants to fall down the stairs again. Oh, fine. Well, what are you standing there for? I told you we're going to a broadcast. What broadcast? Me, Collis Archer. Oh. Go wash your face. There's only clean towels in the bathroom. <laughs> well, what of it? Shall I start a new one? Certainly. And change that filthy dress you have on. Well, How did you get it so dirty? Oh, I fell in the mud. What mud? Oh, you know that puddle in the front of the house. Oh, yes. I'm going to tell you about that. Don't bother. I found out all about it. Well, who made the puddle in the first place? I did with the water sprinkler. Then why did you leave it out there? Because I couldn't bring it in the house. <laughs> now, don't be smart. And go change your dress. Why? Because I'm taking you to a broadcast. What broadcast? Me calling Parker! I already met her. 
No, you didn't, but it wouldn't hurt you. Then you'll understand why a father's hair turns to silver. Is your hair turning to silver? Yes. No, it ain't. It's turning to skin. <laughs> Never mind the wisecracks. Just get your coat. Where are we going? To a radio broadcast. Am I going to meet Carlos Archer again? Yes. I'm very much interested in the show. Besides, it's one of my favorite radio programs. Mm -hmm. And besides, again, I want to get a preview of what you're going to be like when you're a teenage laughing. What am I going to be like? You're going to be in trouble half your life and drive your father mad. Just like Corliss Archer does. Does she drive you mad? No. She drives her own father mad. Then what are you so mad about? I'm just wondering what you're going to be when you grow up. Oh, I can tell you that, Daddy. Oh, you can, huh? Yeah. I'm going to be a fat man with a big mustache. Oh, ridiculous. Little girls grow up to be big women. Like Aunt Sophie? Not that big. <laughs> Am I going to marry Uncle Louie when I grow up? No. You'll marry some unfortunate young man. <laughs> then I ain't going to get married. Well, why not? Well, Uncle Louie married Aunt Sophie, and you married Mummy. What of it? Why should I marry a stranger? <laughs> Never mind. Snooks, I'm going to add a postscript to my radio address. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell folks to listen in to call this Archer on this station every Thursday to the side-splitting adventures of this typical teenage myth. Then I'm going to warn all parents. <laughs> Snooks, are you listening? Yes. Yeah. Then what are you laughing about? Uh, when I listen. When you listen to what? He call us Archer every Thursday night. Good night, sir. Good night, Archer. These are nice little, uh, Little uh, previews of those shows, huh? Although we don't always get the show, we get a little comedy from Snooks and Daddy. Men, the Paul Meyer Shoe Store in Evanston wants your feet to be as comfortable in shoes as possible. After all, you spend most of your life in shoes. That's why you'll find Freeman Shoes at the Paul Meyer Shoe Store. The shoes with Goodyear Welt construction and the finest leathers that breathe and mold to every bend of your foot. Freeman means comfort, elegance, and flexibility, and you'll have a nice selection to choose from at the Paul Meyer Shoe Store, headquarters for Freeman Shoes, 2924 Central in Evanston. All right, now we've got uh, a Baby Snooks and Daddy talking about Inner Sanctum. Ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience, this is the seventh and last of my series of broadcasts as a radio critic. Daddy! Snooks, can't I have any quiet around the house when I'm rehearsing? What are you rehearsing? A radio script. I'm going to tell folks about a radio show broadcast every Wednesday night mm -hmm. called Inner Sanctum Mysteries. It's my favorite thriller dilly. What's that? Well, anything that can send chills up and down your spine is a thriller dilly. Do you understand? Mm hmm. Well, what am I talking about? I don't know. But somebody left the icebox door open and all the thriller dilly melted. <laughs> oh, what's the use? Now, please don't annoy me. <clears throat> Inner Sanctum is your open door to thrilling adventures in the realms of psychological mystery. I'd better change that to murder. What's the matter with this pen? I didn't do it. I didn't say you did it. There's no ink in it. You know where the bottle of ink is, Snoop? Uh-huh. Where? Robespierre drank it. <laughs> drank it? Incredible. No, indelible. <laughs> Good heavens! Well, where is he? Get a doctor. It's all right, Daddy. I made him eat a blotter. <laughs> Snooks, you're lying, aren't you? <laughs> lying. You made up the whole story. Yeah, I made it all up. <laughs> As I suspected. It's just one of your usual prevarications. No, it ain't. It ain't? This one's better than usual. <laughs> now, don't be smart. Run up and get the ink. Why? Because I want to make a change in my script. What script? The Inner Sanctum script. The one I'm using for my broadcast tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know I'm going to discuss Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Inner Sanctum Mysteries? Yes. I listen to them every Wednesday. What are they about? Oh, I don't know. Oh, is that the mystery? <laughs> no. The last Inner Sanctum show, since you ask, happened to be about a scientist who had a pet octopus. Do you know what an octopus is? Mm-hmm. It's an eight-sided cat. <laughs> no. Oh. 
An octopus is a genus of two gill cuttlefish, having eight strong arms with suckers on them. When attacked, it emits a sepia substance, just like ink. You understand? Yeah. Now go get me some ink. <laughs> well, what's the matter? I ain't gonna attack no octopus. <laughs> Did I tell you to attack an octopus? I merely told you what an octopus is. What is it? It's a cuttlefish with eight strong arms that have suckers on them. Now will you get the ink? No. Why not? Because I ain't gonna be one of the suckers. <laughs> Oh, don't be silly. I don't know why you're such a fraidy cat. Ain't you afraid of an octopus? Not a fictional one. Ain't you afraid of snakes and tigers and big bumblebees? Of course not. Daddy. What? Ain't you afraid of nothing except mummy? <laughs> that's a fine thing to say about me. You like it? No. Now, don't get me off the subject. I was talking about Inner Sanctum Mysteries. If you like the creeps, Inner Sanctum will give them to you. Mm -hmm. On it, you will find Raymond. Is he a creep? <laughs> of course not. He's the ghoulish man who each Wednesday is host to as evil a bunch of characters as ever hid behind a creaky door. Mm, that's scary, ain't it, Daddy? Well, it's all in fun, but it's guaranteed to raise your hair. Daddy? Yes? It hasn't done as good for your hair. Oh, good night. Sir. Good night, Daddy. More fun with Snooks and Daddy. We'll return to some more of these little CBS promos in just a moment. Right now, here's a uh, sound from our cassette tape of the month for September. It's an all-star armed forces radio command performance of Dick Tracy and B-flat. Drop that gun and turn around, Tracy. If that voice belongs to who I think it does, I may never turn around. <laughs> what a pleasure. I've always wanted to have a gun in this guy's back. Yeah, and you can pull it up a little, too. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to blow your brains out. <laughs> now drop that gun and turn around. All right. You guessed it, Tracy. I'm flat top. Flat top. How did you ever get a flat top on that egg-shaped head of yours? <laughs> well, now that you got me flat top, what are you going to do with me? <laughs> You're not going to like this at all. <laughs> <laughs> You'll probably hate every minute of it. <laughs> You're really going to get the full treatment, Dad. <laughs> oh, it's going to happen to you. <laughs> Well, what's going to happen? I'd like to laugh a little, too. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put you in the vault, pour a pitcher of cream over your head, and then throw in a tiger with a rough tongue. <laughs> That's from Dick Tracy and B-flat, an all-star command performance broadcast from February 15th of 1945. It's yours for just $5 from the hall closet, box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Bing Crosby stars as Dick Tracy, Dinah Shore as Tess Trueheart, Bob Hope is flat top, Jerry Colon is the police chief, and we also have Jimmy Durante, Judy Garland, the Andrews sisters, and Frank Sinatra, who comes on as shaky. It's a great hour of classic radio entertainment, and it's our cassette tape for September. Five dollars from the hall closet, box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Or you can get this tape at any office of Northwest Federal or when you visit our Metro Golden Memory Shop. Dick Tracy and B Flat, a command performance from Armed Forces Radio in 1945. Don't forget, this month we also offer the War of the Worlds, the famous Orson Welles broadcast from 1938. That's also yours for $5 from the Hall Closet at Northwest Federal or the MGM Shop. And if you'd like both tapes, send $10 to the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. All right, now let's get back to Snooks and Daddy as they talk about Ozzie and Harriet. Daddy! What is it, Snooks? Will you give me a dime? Aren't you too big a girl to be begging for a dime? All right, give me a dollar. Forget it. I thought I told you to get dressed. Are we going someplace? Yes, we're calling on our new neighbors, Ozzie Nelson and Harriet Hilliard. Who are they? Why, surely you must know who they are. No. Ozzie Nelson, the famous band leader, and his beautiful wife, Harriet Hilliard. They're the ones who have that wonderful new radio program, The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, every Sunday. Now, with my experience in matrimony, I might give them a few pointers for their program. 
I could tell them a few things about life. And it wouldn't hurt you to listen. Mommy says I'm too young to learn about bees. <laughs> well, you are. But I know. <laughs> you know about the bees? Mm-hmm. If you swat them, they bite you. Don't they, Daddy? I don't know. Has Mama told you yet? <laughs> now, don't be a smarty. What I'm going to tell Ozzie and Harriet will be more in a philosophical vein. After all, marriage has many pitfalls. Hmm? Pitfalls, pitfalls. Don't you know what a pitfall is? Yeah, it's something I throw at my teacher. <laughs> That's a spitball. I like making spitballs. That's disgusting. Here I am, presuming to give Ozzie and Harriet advice for their new radio show. I pretend that I've lived a life of fullness and richness. I pretend that I raise my children as shining examples. And all the while, I'm living a mockery. Oh, poor little daddy. No, no. I'm a failure. Would you be a success if I was a good little girl? Yes. Poor little daddy. <laughs> oh. I'll never know why I didn't remain a bachelor. What's a bachelor? A bachelor's a man who never makes the same mistake once. <laughs> Is Ozzy a bachelor? No, he's married to Harriet. That's the point of their program. Harriet Hilliard is really Mrs. Ozzie Nelson. And every Sunday on their show, they make the audience laugh at their adventures. Harriet is Ozzie's young wife. Why ain't you married to Harriet? Because I'm married to Mommy. Why? So you're beginning to wonder too, huh? <laughs> well, let's not go into that. Now, here we are. This is the house. Hmm, not a bad place for a couple of young folks. Who are the young folks? Ozzie and Harriet! Go ahead and ring the bell. Mm. Mm. No answer. Wonder why. Maybe it's because they ain't home. Well, it seems our whole trip was wasted. What a break. Are we going to break something? Oh, don't be childish. Mm, I want to break a window. Now, why should you want to break a window? Because then our trip won't be wasted. Oh, behave yourself. I think I'll write a note so they'll know I was here. Have you got a blank piece of paper, Snooks? Mm-hmm, but there's writing all over it. <laughs> oh, forget it. I'll write the note on this old envelope. Let's see, what'll I say? Dear Ozzie and Harriet, sorry you weren't home, but I want to take this opportunity to tell you that I think your new radio program, The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, is swell. I know that all our listeners will be tuned to it every Sunday on their Columbia station. Yours for laughs and good fun, Lancelot Higgins. Now they'll know I've been here. Here's a rock, Daddy, so the paper won't blow away. Oh, throw that rock away. All right. No! You broke a window. Well, now they know I've been here. <laughs> Baby Snooks and Daddy. One more little gem from this season of 1943-44 as they promote the Columbia Network programs, and uh, we'll have that in just uh, 30 seconds. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where you can shop with confidence for all the family. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where Eden's Expressway, Skokie Boulevard, and Lake Avenue meet at Womack. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, easy to reach, easy to park, easy to shop. Back to school values all this week at Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, Womack. And now for the finale of our holiday weekend special, let's rejoin Baby Snooks and Daddy. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like for a moment to discuss a program which presents radio, stage, and screen stars in adaptations of the world's outstanding stories every Tuesday evening. Daddy! I'll make believe I don't hear her. <laughs> the program is called This Is My Best, and on it you will meet such famous stars as Edward Arnold, Agnes Moorhead, Lee Bowman, Paulette Goddard, and a host of others. Mm, I like that show, Daddy. I like it too, Snooks. That's why I'm talking about it. In fact, it's one of my favorite programs. What program? This is my best. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry I shouted. Well, I'd give a million dollars if you'd learn to stop pestering me. Could you lend me a quarter while I'm learning? <laughs> no. But if you stop asking me questions, I'll give you a bright new penny. Haven't you got a dirty old nickel? <laughs> what do you want it for? 
I wrote a thanks in no tan, Sophie, and I want to buy a stamp. Oh, well, that's very commendable. What did you say? I said, dear Aunt Sophie, thank you for the pencil. It's something I wanted all my life, but not very much. <laughs> oh, no. No good? Terrible. Your gratitude should match the spirit in which the gift is given. And you're acting very small about it. Well, it was a very small gift. <laughs> I don't be small. And leave me alone. Why? Because I've got that marvelous Tuesday night program, This Is My Best, on my mind. And stop being a tease. I'm teasing. Well, you're not letting me read my script. What would you call that? A script tease. <laughs> very funny. <laughs> yeah, nice. No. Now, will you please go away? Mm, I want to hear about the script. All right. It's a critique of one of my favorite radio shows, mm. This Is My Best which presents motion picture stars interpreting the works of famous authors, scenarists, and playwrights, such as James Kane, Robert Nathan, James Thurber, Dorothy Parker. I wrote a story once, Daddy. I can imagine. What was it about? It was about a duck. Well, how did it go? Once upon a time, there was a duck. The end. <laughs> well, is that all there was to it? Uh-huh. But certainly you can write more than that about the life of a duck. Not this duck. Why not? It's a dead duck. <laughs> no, you've listened to This Is My Best, haven't you? Mm-hmm, I like it. Well, haven't you noticed how meaty the stories are? Mm-hmm. They satisfy a certain hunger people have for the real, the dramatic incidents of life. Oh. Now, do you know what's wrong with your story? Yeah. It doesn't satisfy a hunger. Right. Shall I call it the roast duck? <laughs> Again. Your story just doesn't ring the bell, and that's all there is to it. It doesn't? No. Ah, uh, never mind, never mind. <laughs> that bell has nothing to do with your story. It's just someone at the door. Shall I answer it? No, no. Now, where was I? You were just interrupted by the doorbell. Oh, yes. Uh... When you listen to This Is My Best each Tuesday evening on this station, you enjoy the best efforts of such great writers as Paul Gallico, McKinley Cantor, Ludwig Bemelmans, and scores of others. Portrayed for radio by Hollywood's biggest names. It's This Is My Best every Tuesday. If you like a screen story, or a magazine story, or if you like a play. <laughs> I like to play. Yeah, I like to play too. And that's Baby Snooks and Daddy with a series of six of apparently seven uh, radio promotional pieces that they produced, uh, participated in for the Columbia Network to herald the brand new 1943-44 season. <laughs> Well, that's it for today. The old clock up on the studio wall says it's time to go for now, but we'll be back again next Saturday from 1 to 5 with more nostalgic sounds. Next Saturday, Spike Jones in the Spotlight Review, the front page on Academy Award, Jimmy Durante and Gary Moore in the Comedy Caravan, the Walter Winchell Jurgens Journal, and our guest will be Pat O'Brien reminiscing about his career on the, the stage and in the movies. Our thanks to Mort Paradise, Dennis Bubaz, Joel Bogart, and Gary Schroeder for their help behind the scenes. To our sponsors, Northwest Federal Savings, Nelson Hirschberg Ford, and Eden's Plaza Shopping Center for making this weekly get-together possible. And to you out there in Radio Land for making it worthwhile. This is Chuck Shaden speaking. Have a nice weekend. Drive safely if you're driving anywhere this Labor Day holiday. And if you're coming to the movie tonight at Northwest Federal, we'll see you there for Blockheads and Flying Deuces, a pair of great Laurel and Hardy comedies. Thanks for listening. This is WNIB in Chicago at 97 FM. And this is Bruce Duffy welcoming you now once again to Zephyr. Zephyr is a two-hour program of short, familiar classical music, which we present every evening beginning around 5 o'clock. We'll begin tonight's program with some piano music of Chopin, also in this first hour some ballet music, a couple of songs, and also music of Fritz Kreisler and Johann Strauss, Jr. Then in the second hour, beginning at about 6 p.m., we have a violin sonata by Brahms, some ballet music by Catalani, 
some excerpts from Cav and Pag, Cavalleria Rusticana and Ipagliacci, the famous operatic twins, and also music of Rachmaninoff in the second hour. To begin, we have music of Chopin. We're going to hear four pieces for piano, three impromptus, the numbers one in A flat, two in F sharp, and three in G flat, and the fantasy impromptu in C sharp minor. Music of Chopin, played by pianist Der Ziffra. <laughs> 